right, we're ready to go. Call to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the invocation. Uh, Pastor C. Ferguson from Shepherd of the Hills, Lutheran Church. Yeah. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessings upon our town council this evening, and we ask that you would guide them in their deliberations. We also pray for our great fair that begins this weekend. We pray for favorable wedding or weather, and um, also ask for protection and safety of all participate in the great fair. And Lord, may the uh, hospitality of our great community reach out to those who visit, so as they leave, they leave as friends of Fountain Hills. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Steve. Roll call, please, Beth. Mayor Kavanaugh? Yes. Vice Mayor Elke? Here. Council Member Yates? Present. Council Member Dickey? Here. Council Member Hampton? Here. Council Member Brown? Here. Council Member Lee Here. I just have one item that I want to mention under my mayor's report. I uh, would like to congratulate our manager, Ken Buchanan, the 2013 recipient of the John J. Jack Dubolsky Award presented by the Arizona City County Management Association. That is very prestigious. He's, a, he's not a speech guy. <laughs> we have two special reports. Uh, the first is uh, from Councilwoman Dickey, who is uh, on the Maricopa County Association of Governments Regional Domestic Violence Council. And she's going to give us a report of their meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Just real quickly, um, again, thanks for forwarding my name, and, uh, and then uh, Mayor Marie Lopez Rogers uh, appointed me there. A little background on it, because it's probably uh, not aware that the MAG, which is the Maricopa Association of Governments, the Regional Domestic Violence Council, was created in January 2000 um, to implement the MAG Regional Plan on Domestic Violence. Because domestic violence touches every segment of our community, this council was specifically designed to reflect a variety of community interests, namely the core groups that are impacted and respond to domestic violence, businesses, criminal justice, education, faith-based institutions, government, health care, social services, and, uh, of course, domestic violence survivors. And actually, I didn't know this, the council is one of the largest coordinated community response coalition of its kind in the country, providing the first forum where voices from across the region will come together to address domestic violence issues. The council itself is drawn from local elected officials, members of the Governor's Office Division for Women, the business community, health care professionals, prosecutors and police officers, shelter and service providers, and private funders, and is charged with working with the community in order to implement the recommendations from the MAG Regional Domestic Violence Plan. They're also work on a protocol evaluation project right now. And so um, you know also MAG itself has seven policy committees and 19 technical committees, and that's what sometimes you'll get those updates of, from the transportation committees and things like that and economic development. Um, there are around 30 members. Um, I went. The first thing I went to was on 12th, and then the last one was uh, February 7th. Uh, you kind of go around the table. You hear there are presentations. You're, you're able to hear what other municipalities are doing, what, what tribes and nonprofits. There's a lot of law enforcement there, and other agencies, and we share uh, efforts. And I was able to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done over the, over a few years. You know, we've we've um, we have Texas Hip, of course. Um, we had a partnership with the Public Safety Advisory Commission, um, CARE Fountain Hills, um, our neighbors in law enforcement. We've had presentations uh, here and with our joint meetings, and they've actually had presentations at the high school. Um, we've, we've enacted those little shoe cards that you can put in the women's, usually the women's rooms for, for um, uh, help for, for kids, and sometimes the, you know, the kids even in high school have to deal with this. Um, CARE did some cell phone collections. 
and of course just raising public awareness in general. So told them about my brief experience at the uh, Weed and Seed communities when I was uh, with the U.S. Attorney's Office and that we work for safer communities. Uh, there's going to be a lot to learn. I, you know, I kind of jumped into in the middle, as you know, um, to, but to see how Fountain Hills can participate. And, um, you know, I look forward to continuing to work with them um, and, and getting further involvement as we go along. Do you have any questions or anything? Or anybody's always welcome to come, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you for representing us on that council. I know that's a little extra time for you, so we do appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, we have Councilman Zicke and Councilman Yates are going to bring us up to date on our application to Grand Canyon University. Want to go first? Mm -hmm. um, well, we know that Grand Canyon University was looking to expand, and so we wanted to um, see what we could find out about it. So on January 3rd, the council gave me and um, Cecil the uh, permission and responsibility to respond, so we sent a letter of interest so that we could participate. We attended the presentation and tour on the 18th of January, so Cecil, Cecil will talk a little bit about that. Okay. It was neat to go back to college. Uh, tremendous um, business model that GCU has, a uh, mix of uh, private sector ideas. Um, quite frankly, they have a tremendous product at a very, very reasonable fee. They're looking to expand their uh, college programs on the east side by actually replicating their existing campus, their fast track. Uh, they had quite a very impressive program, very impressive facilities. Um, the very least that uh, Jenny and I were able to do were meet with the president of the organization, walk with them pretty much most of the afternoon, uh, planning in his ear, Fountain Hills, Fountain Hills, Fountain Hills. So for distance learning or some other opportunities that come down the road, I, I definitely think we're in line there. So I want to congratulate uh, Councilperson Dickey for heading this up because uh, I definitely think we accomplished our goal. Thank you, uh, Cecil. But you were really good to have there because you were <laughs> really good to say Fountain Hills, I think, uh, <laughs> twice every minute. The, uh, the responses to, if you wanted to respond to the expansion, were due on February 15th. So we wanted to, um, after further consideration, and sent a letter to the mayor to take a look at. We did send this letter to Grand Canyon on the 11th, so it was before the 15th, and just want to let you know what we said, which was thank you for the presentation and tour of Grand Canyon University on the 18th. My colleague, Councilman Cecil Yates, and I appreciated the opportunity to learn more about your exciting campus expansion. Based on what we heard and the parameters put forth in your request for propose, proposal, it appears that Fountain Hills may not fit the current mode for GCU's immediate plan. The, the urban core environment and infrastructure needs in order to meet the ambitious time frame, unfortunately, do not allow for us to respond at this time. Please know, though, this in no way is meant to express disinterest, and in fact, we remain very engaged in exploring avenues for higher education options, including satellite campuses and distance learning in the town of Fountain Hills. We're confident that our community has much to offer and hope that you will think of us as you move forward. So basically, um, you know, we had our presentation from SPAC and uh, about, the about the economic development uh, plan. So I, I believe that Cecil and I and everybody will be working as we go forward with SPAC and others on that feasibility study that's in the economic development plan and that we'll be able to create a, a um, continuing educational package that will accentuate what Fountain Hills does has to offer. So we feel very positive about that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we will go on to call to the public. Anyone, Beth? Here we have four cards. Okay. Peter Bargo, Randy Beard, Maxine Decker, followed by Val Stafford. All right. Just to remind everybody, you have three minutes. And state your name and just the town. Don't tell us the street to live on. Go ahead, Peter. You're a pro. Sir. Yeah. I'm getting good at this. Oh, thank you. I am Peter Fordell. I've been a resident of Fountain Hills for about 20 years. Um, I'm a small town, a small business owner as well. Uh, I now own Sidewinder Cycles, certified Harley Davidson repair on Colony Drive. And I'm here to say thank you for a number of things. So we had our grand opening uh, two Saturdays ago. And I don't know what the record is for grand openings in Fountain Hills, but we must have come pretty close. We lost count at 175 people attending this grand opening, including 100 motorcycle riders. Sheriff Joe Arpaio was there, and a lot of people came out to support us. It was really amazing, and there's a couple people I'd like to mention uh, special thanks to. 
Madam Mayor, thank you for attending and saying some words. Um, Council Member Yates, thank you very much for showing up. Council Member Leger, thank you so much for showing up and supporting us. It really meant a lot to us for you guys to be there. Um, it was a tremendous event, and I think we're off to a running start in the shop. And uh, I've already, you know, uh, racked up about $98 worth of sales tax paid to the town of Fountain Hills. Um, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll do about, you know, 100 times that by the end of the year. But uh, it was really wonderful. And thanks to everybody in Fountain Hills for supporting us. And hopefully we'll be on our way shortly here, paying the bills and um, being a new fixture in the town. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Peter. Right. Randy Beard. Maxine Decker. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. My name is Maxine Decker. I've been a resident here for about 10 years, but um, uh, for about 20 years, my first husband, I say my first husband because I've been widowed twice. My first husband and I had a place in Rio Verde for years and we were winter visitors. So I know the area quite well. Um, I'm here tonight, actually, to talk about our taxes. And we want to remind people how we spent $72,000. Oh, I need to tell you my credentials just before that. Sorry. I have, was a social worker. I graduated in social work from the University of Minnesota with a, a Hennepin County social worker for many years. Also, I graduated from Wayne State University in education, so I was also a teacher. That university is in Michigan. And also, I just retired in uh, November from working with special needs children. But in my background in social work, I was usually working with abused and exploited children. But I want to turn more specifically to children, and for instance, I had three, and we paid ourselves out of our own salaries for their music lessons, guitar, piano, uh, summer boy scout camp or soccer camp, things like that. And I certainly didn't expect the public to help <laughs> dole out any money to us. In speaking about that, I want to think that uh, our town needs to think about where are we going to spend our money from the council. We, of course, need to think about safety first. And for instance, we need to have public parks and, the, and our beautiful fountain maintained, and the fire, police, roads, staff salaries uh, taken care of. And according to um, Mayor Kavanaugh's little talk at the tea party the other night, uh, we have spent $72,000 for this year, but we're going to, be going to be down to the bare bones this next year. So I would ask that we concentrate on spending our money there instead of other things. So uh, with that said, I also want to let you know that there's a small group of us who are pitching down at the theater because we, for several reasons, one of which is certainly that we prefer our tax money to be spent on more basic things. So I just brought a sample of my, of one of our posters. Or our, we're just sitting out there, we're minding our own business, and uh, we're just taking turns just saying some of our own opinions about well, how, what we would like to see done. So I'll let you see it. And I'll All right, thank you. Val, Val Stasek was the last speaker. She's indicated she does not want to speak. Okay. All right, I'll read the consent agenda items. There are seven items tonight. First is consideration of approving the town council meeting minutes from February 7th, 2013. Consideration of approving an application for extension of premises patio permit, temporary change submitted by Marita Creha for the purpose of a temporary extension of premises in conjunction with the Discraft Memorial Championship event held on March 2nd, 2013. Number three, consideration of approving a wine festival license, wine fair license application submitted by Dennis M. Minchella, 
representing the Cocopelli Winery for participation in the Thunderbird Artist Annual Fountain Hills Fine Art and Wine Affair scheduled for March 6, 15th, 16th, and 17th, 2013. Number four, consideration of approving a special event liquor license application submitted by Dean Linza representing the Fountain Hills and Lower Verde Valley Museum and Historical Society for the purpose of a fundraiser scheduled to be held on March 16, 2013. Number five, consideration of approving a special event legal license application submitted by Donald Eric Anderson, representing the Sons of Amvet for the purpose of a fundraiser scheduled to be held on March 17, 2013. Number six is consideration of Resolution 2013-09, approving the Town of Fountain Hills Board of Adjustment Bylaws, amended and restated February 21, 2013. And our last one, number seven, is consideration of Resolution 2013-03, an intergovernmental agreement with the Fountain Hills Sanitary District relating to various services. And I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as listed. Second. Any speaker cards? No, ma'am. <coughs> and a roll call then, please. Councilmember Yates? Aye. Councilmember Hanson? Aye. Councilmember Lachey? Aye. Councilmember Dickey? Aye. Vice Mayor Elke? Aye. Councilmember Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kavanaugh? Aye. Mayor Seven Zero? Thank you. Now, our regular agenda item, number eight, consideration of approving a request from Fountain Hills Little League for permission to purchase, install, and maintain three new scoreboards in Golden Eagle Park and to permit the names of annual sponsors of the group to be displayed on the scoreboards and on the backstop during the group's regular session and playoffs. Okay. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council, I'd, I'd like to ask the community services director to give an introduction on what the issue before you tonight. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council. Um, I included in the packet uh, some material, uh, specifically the letter that we received a number of weeks ago, uh, written by Mr. Uh, Rick Barker, who, is rep who represents the Louie as their vice president. He's joining us this evening, so if there are questions specifically that I cannot answer, uh, or the town attorney cannot answer specific to the Little League and their request, uh, he is here to answer those questions as well. Um, the request comes uh, as the end of the cycle, uh, useful history of the scoreboards that are out there. Um, they are of the uh, vintage that when you have a light bulb that goes out, uh, it literally takes the whole scoreboard out, doesn't have the modern technology that exists today. Uh, it is now difficult, sometimes impossible for them to get parts that maintain what is out there now. So they are offering not only to acquire the piece, also install it, but then uh, perhaps just as importantly, if not more importantly, uh, continue to maintain the scoreboards at no expense to the town in perpetuity. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in exchange for that, what they would need to do to generate some funds to recover those costs is they're requesting that the town allow them to place the name of sponsors that would support that effort on the scoreboard, and then during their regular season and through the playoffs, they would request that they be allowed to put some signage uh, for uh, the sponsors on the backstop of fields two, three, and four. So with that, I would answer any questions you might have. Okay, questions from council? Council Mnuchin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, we, I, I asked uh, Andrew a question just about this because um, naming um, policy or anything that we might have either in the town or maybe the league, maybe the Little League has a policy on um, who is allowed to sponsor them so that there's some measure of, um, of, of, I don't know what the word is, or control or some way that we will know what would be on there. I think um, Andrew mentioned that there might be some other cities that have models for this kind of thing. Andrew, you want to? Madam Mayor, members of the council would be happy to take that one. Uh, one of the things that we want to, to get some clarity from you all is policy direction on a distinction between two different types of, of use that we're talking about here. Um, typically when we have donated items, and you see this it's typically in school districts in the state, but no other cities seem to have, have had the municipal 
park donation where there's a piece of infrastructure that's sponsored by someone that has advertising directly on it. Most of the ones that are donated have the name of the person that donated them, whether the company, and it stays there forever, and, and that's a pretty simple one to handle. That's much like the plaques we do for all the artwork around town. The problem that we, we don't have the answer to and what we need some direction from you all is once you put something up there that has an advertising component that continually rolls over or is different or can be changed from season to season, that then opens it up to the discussions we've had prior about the difficulty of regulating content of those users on the signs after the point at which the town opens it up. Because it's owned by the town, we're subject to the same problem that we've had when we talked about our our sign, you know, directional signs and putting actual advertising for businesses on them, is you can't discriminate amongst the businesses. So if one of our users that may not be something that Little League wants to have up there or that we, the town would want to have up there, is one of the, the people who wants to advertise and is rejected, like a dispensary or something else, that would be a problem for us because we've opened the venue up to it. The sponsors' names of the people who paid for the scoreboard being up there just thanking them for their donation and leaving them up there all the time, that's perfectly fine. It's the rotating nature that's a little bit different. We haven't found any municipalities in the state that have a policy on that, but we'd like to get some input from you before we come back and craft something for you all. Mm -hmm. The other type of advertising that we're talking about that we think is a far different type is placing banners on or around the, the backstop during the season so that the Little League sponsors, whatever the businesses are, have a banner that can be placed up there and left for the, the season. And we think that's a totally different animal and is perfectly fine. Little League would, would have that as part of their use of the facility, have the right to do that, and they can generate whatever kind of income they want from it. It's the town-owned sign that's permanently installed that we need to get some feedback from y'all. So we just didn't want to plow forward with anything. Whatever you decide is fine. We just want to make sure we have a policy on it. Mesa has a pretty good base of a marketing alliance kind of program that they use that's a bit different than this, but we think is a good base of maybe molding a program that would work out just fine. We just wanted to make sure you all were aware of the issues before we move forward with this particular topic. Could you, could you explain a little bit what Mesa does? Mesa has a, a marketing alliance program that's basically for sponsored bigger events. They don't have it for pieces of infrastructure like this. They have a naming policy if you want to name a building or do things like we do. But theirs is more focused on, for instance, like if the Great Fair had a, a, a big name sponsor like you know, Budweiser, you know, the Budweiser Big Fair, you know, whatever they wanted to call it at the time. That's the type of thing they've created guidelines for so that they can have Prior to application, people understand the guidelines and the rules on who would be allowed to sponsor and who the city is interested in partnering with. It's a bit of a nuance on the advertising issue because you're not putting out there something for which people can buy advertising. It's the city choosing to go into a relationship with someone to sponsor an event, co-sponsor, if you will. So the policy is not dead on what we're looking for, but it's certainly a good starting point. We have some, some decent language that we use in there. Is there any way that we could write into a policy that we have the right of refusal for a sponsor, or do we, is that possible, since it's, it's our property? Yeah, the, the problem is that the case law doesn't support us on that. Once opened up, a business is a business is a business, as far as the courts have been concerned. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we've been concerned of, you know, going back to, I remember Farrell having this conversation in the 90s about the signs, the directional signs that are up around town, not having individual businesses on them because you can't tell one business they're okay and another one they're not. You can't have a content-based regulation when you get to that kind of advertising. It can only be time, place, and manner. So that's the concern we've always had with programs like this, and this just happened to be the same issues came up with respect to the permanently installed signs with advertising amounts of Little League. Council mm -hmm. what if Little League just kept possession of the sign and we leased them the space that the sign is on for a dollar a year or something that it's no longer 
That is not. The sign itself is not town property. If, if the town doesn't own the sign, then there is certainly a broader latitude on who can go on the sign. Um, that raises a gift clause issue that we have to evaluate on the value of giving town property for advertising purposes. That's a whole different analysis that we could probably figure out a way to make that work. But as long as the town owns it, then we have the not able to tell people no that we might want to tell no. What about school buses? How do school buses work? The, the school district has policy, I mean, actually state laws that address how they advertise on school buses. So we don't have nearly that level of direction from the legislature. Andrew, I recall that there's, in years ago you used to see advertising for cigarettes and alcohol and billboards, and there's been laws that were passed that prevented that. I don't know if it was state or federal. Do you know offhand? I believe there's federal regulations that prohibit okay. alcohol and cigarette advertising in certain circumstances, not all of them, because clearly the magazine still has. Maybe that, maybe that would be a particular policy that we could look at, because I think those are primarily what we're perhaps concerned or not concerned about Joe's Automotive or uh, those types of advertisers. So maybe we look at something that's in line with that that would perhaps prohibit that type of advertising if it's in line with what the federal regulations are. The Mesa policy does a little bit of that in, in terms of the way that they uh, set the guidelines for how people will be um, evaluated and whether or not they're, they're going to consider them for a municipal partnership of some sort. They don't cut alcohol out altogether because they're they're aware, obviously, that some of their major events could certainly have you know a local brewery or something else that might want to sponsor. So they don't have that carve out, but they have a specific set of things that are important to them if that is the kind of sponsor they have. Um, we could certainly have something like that. I, I think the more that you structure it up front and then just apply it evenly, the better off you are instead of having a content-based evaluation of each one. But again, the concern was is greater now than it was when we had this discussion 18, 19 years ago, because now we have a lot of businesses that have in their name things that would be objectionable to folks right off the bat. There are website names that are business names that would be inappropriate to be staring at little leaguers for a season. So those are the kinds of things that it raises. We want to try and figure out a way to make it work because obviously this is a program everybody supports. We just want to make you aware that the way that it's proposed at the moment has a bug in it that we need to have your direction on. Right. Um, I know that for the football games, they do have banners and they get sponsors. Since we have a representative here from Little League, I, I was wondering if she could come up and... Maybe you could let us know if you have some sort of a policy for criteria for advertising. I know you do it at football games. You accept banners and um, you have any kind of golf items you do that too. I'm sure I can find some policies. I'm new to the Fountain Hills Little League being on the board, so I don't really know all the policies. I'm sure being Little League, being national, international, there are policies on what we're allowed to accept as a sponsor. Um, I'm sure that we can't just accept, you know, everybody that wants to sponsor our organization. So I can find out what that policy is um, of acceptance of sponsorships and, you know, and get back to you guys on that. And then um, what I think with, with the sponsorships, like, they have to come to us and we have to approve them as a sponsor. That I do know. And it's not just for the school board. It's a, it's a whole package. We, um, you know, we have a single, double, triple in the home run. And depending on what level of sponsorship that you choose to have, on each sign would have uh, five sponsors. And if they choose the triple or the home run, part of that sponsorship package would be um, advertisement on the school board. So it's not, money isn't just specifically for the um, advertising spot on the school board, um, but obviously it just helps us and added benefit to local businesses to you know to advertise or to be one of our sponsors or one of our biggest sponsors. So uh, we are definitely going to be very selective of obviously who we put on mm -hmm. um, at the take on as a sponsor because it's literally, we can't lose our charter membership as a little league by taking on a sponsor that doesn't fit the, you know, the criteria of, of little league. Okay. So, and we're going to try to keep them, we want all the sponsors to pro, uh, stay.
stay on for at least two years because every time we switch out a, a sponsor, it costs four hundred dollars per sign. And this this two thousand um, dollars a scoreboard when we change those out. So it's definitely uh, we're pushing for a two year sponsorship because that's you know that cuts into a lot of the money every year that we have to dish out um, to to do that. So if we do a two year commitment, it financially will make sense for us to do that. And like I said, we'll maintain everything and uh, take care of all the maintenance of the scoreboard. Well, I wonder if perhaps we could let them bring us their policy and we could take a look at that. They might already have some sort of criteria worked out and I, uh, maybe they have something already in place because they know they do for the banners right. and for other events. Um, and of course, I'm sure that you've looked at those carefully since you don't want to lose your status. So right. if it's okay with the council that we could just toss this back, so to speak, <laughs> to you, yeah. and, and if you could um, give us your criteria and right. let, let our attorney look at that. Does that be okay with everybody? Mayor, is that a motion? Uh, do I need a motion? Can we just... Do you want a question? Yes. Um, and is there anything we could do tonight? Because in their letter, they said that they needed the decision no later than February 5th, which obviously right. we've already passed. <laughs> if there's anything we could do to at least let them move forward with the contingency that this issue gets solved in so we're not holding them up. Well, I guess we could approve that they could go ahead and get the scoreboard. We're just worried about the advertising, right? Yeah, in, in the component of the mm -hmm. scoreboard when we order them because they have to have extra support on them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I understand if we have to wait, we got to wait. We're just trying to hit opening day. So opening day, our sponsors are up there. But when we order them, it has to be one you know, one whole piece because it's going to change the, um, the structure of how it's mm -hmm. you know, installed and how it's ordered, the pieces that were ordered. I was going to ask you, uh, Andrew, can we make the motion as it stands but then say pending sponsorship guidelines forthcoming from the Little League? Would that, would that still be action that we could take? Uh, Madam Mem Mayor and members of the council, what I suggest is if you want to give them direction that the initial sponsorship is fine with the town, um, having them have the people who actually pay for this scoreboard cost, and I'm assuming that's the whole idea is the first group of them are going to pay for the cost and ongoing after that. Uh, no, we were going to, it's coming out of Fountain Hills Little League. Thank you, Tom. We're going to pay. For okay, it. so you're going to you're going to pay and then get repaid by by this, by yeah by okay. obtaining the sponsor. So it's coming out of our our, uh, our budget. So in in that case, what, what we're looking at is an initial donation, much like an art donation. And what we need to determine between now and the time that that it was installed is whether or not we would go down the, the path that Councilmember Hanson mentioned that perhaps if this remains in Little League's hands and these are their scoreboards to to use and we figure out some sort of a lease or license agreement to allow them to go on there to, to do so or if we figure out another way to make it work. But it, Madam Mayor, the door is going to be open. There's really, there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. The, what, finish that last sentence. I, I think that once the, door, once the town owns the structure and the advertisement is up, the door is open. Mm -hmm. And I, there's really not anything we can do to change that other than not own the sign. So I think that Madam Mayor, my, my <coughs> comment is, first, I want to applaud you for coming up with a private sector solution. I think that's tremendous paying for your own things. I applaud you. Um, secondly, I have a feeling that the Little League standards of what is going to be on there is going to be way more strict than what we do. Um, and I applaud you on that as well. <laughs> uh, so quite frankly, I'm, I'm on board with let's give it to you and let the system work. And I'm a big free market guy, and I, I again, applaud you. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Vice Mayor, okay. I agree with Councilman Yates, but at the same time, I don't want to incur uh, a lawsuit because we've gone forward. The, the, the chances of this happening are probably very, very, very small. But if it does happen, I mean, we're, we're getting advice from legal counsel that we need to have some kind of policy in place. Um, and, I, and I certainly would be in favor of going forward and, uh, and um, approving or accepting the purchase and the donation of the signs. And then we can probably very quickly work out what those parameters are going to be as far as the, the sponsors are concerned and, and do both of those and still continue to move forward, but I, I would feel a little more comfortable having some kind of policy in place just so just so everything's clear. Madam Mayor? Okay. So, Andrew, would the 
the motion then be to accept the sign as it's presented and just that, or do we need to actually vote on the whole thing and then get a sub-motion? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Yates, I think that we have clear enough direction if you just accept the sign to explore the other options and get back to you, knowing that this component will be part of a larger policy that we'll bring back to you later on, but we'll also give you a specific report back on how this works and interested to see their guidelines and see if we can incorporate those as well. But I, I think exploring something or Hanson's approach is the one that's going to be what we'll evaluate prior to them installing. It, and the things to look at too, this may not be just a policy just for the little league signs. If there's other things that come up, if some folks want to have a, you know, another town on property, have some signs up. So we want to have a particular policy in place. So, it, you know, get this, get this sorted out now. I think that'll work. We, we have it scheduled for a discussion item, I think, on the first meeting in April to come back to you with a full policy that addresses all the different marketing alliances and everything else. And this will just be the first part of it. Andrew, in the suggested motion on the agenda item, if we just did the first half of that, would that be acceptable to move forward? To approve the request of the Fountain Hills Little League for permission to purchase, install, and ongoing maintenance, three new scoreboards in Eagle, Golden Eagle Park. And leave it at that? Yes. Okay. That's a motion. Right. Good job, Pat. All right. Uh, I'll just go with all in favor. Aye. 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 Any speaker cards on uh, on this? No, ma'am. No, I get pictures. Thank you, dear. Hi. Okay. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Very there, we got that. Yeah. All right. Now we have consideration of approving a reclaimed water use agreement between the town of Fountain Hills and the Fountain Hills Sanitary District relating to Fountain Park. Ken Mark Mark. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council, as you're aware, this is an agreement that the respective attorneys between the town and the sanitation district have been working on for a number of months. It basically takes the verbal agreement that we've had and puts it into writing. Uh, most of the information that's included in there is what we've been doing uh, in the past. Uh, a couple of points I did want to make. Uh, it ensures the continued receipt of effluent water from the sanitary district that assumes that uh, they have the effluent to provide to us. Uh, should that not be the case, obviously that would change. Uh, it also offers us uh, the ability to acquire that um, under this agreement at no cost in exchange for access to the uh, recharge facilities that they have in the park, as well as the use of the lake itself for uh, the storage of effluent water. Um, the agreement is through 2018, June 30th of 2018, and is renewable for five additional five-year periods, so we're looking at a total of essentially a 30-year agreement. So it's definitely long-term. So with that, uh, myself, or to a probably a greater extent, the town attorney would be great to, or able to answer any questions that you have. Were there any major changes to the water use agreement that, any major changes? We don't have one at the moment, so. Well, they're, I mean, they're all changes, but there are no changes to the actual operation. Yeah, okay. It, this is, uh, they're required under their permit to have a water use reuse agreement with the reusers of the water, and obviously the town's the biggest one. This was a memorialization of what's already going on out there, and the only the time involved was customizing it a little bit because the town's a slightly different user than the other users. Okay, and I guess the only thing that I was concerned about, which I think I mentioned to you before, was that um, the town has the right to get the water before the golf courses for our parks, if that. So we choose, correct? That's correct. That's we, are, we are second only to the district itself. Second to the district. For Fountain Park. Correct. Right, Fountain Park. Anyone else have any questions for Mark? Mayor, do we have any speaker cards? No, ma'am. Okay. Then I move to uh, approve the reclaim water use agreement between the town of Fountain Hills and the Fountain Hills Sanitary District for Fountain Park. Second. Yes. So on the capital improvement plan that we're talking about later, we have um, the 300, I think it was 300,000 for water quality. So that's not part, because that was sort of part of the idea, but now that's not part of this idea, correct? Correct. This is simply for the reuse of water. The, the other agreement, the IGA that you're talking about, specifically talks about that. About the uh, quality of the water, ma'am. Correct. So the, um, but the lake is still the major 
I mean, that's what it's there for, to be for effluent disposal. But the water quality itself, we will be working on trying to improve that um, in our capital improvement plan. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'm from Dickey. The, the reuse agreement is simply a, an arrangement that identifies who's responsible for the quality where. So at the point of delivery, which is the point at which the water goes into the lake, center district's responsible at that point. From that point on, it's the county's responsibility. Any change to that responsibility is what will be handled in further IGA if we come to one. So it, this is just formatting or establishing in, in a written document what we're already doing out there. If we modify that arrangement, that's when we'll be back to you to talk to you about it. Great, thanks. All right, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mayor seven zero. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Discussion with possible directions to staff related to Saguaro Boulevard and Avenue to Fountain intersection. Paul. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, um, this, this presentation stems from the, uh, the previous work study we had when we discussed the uh, intersection and the direction at that time was to come back um, with just the um, current three-way stop configuration with two lanes or the roundabout option. So that's what I'll be presenting tonight. Um, just some analysis that we had previously done. The uh, intersection has had a total of um, 11 accidents over the last five years, so an average about two a year. Um, one accident in 2012 was a car and pedestrian accident, um, but it was actually a um, person doing traffic control at a special event um, that got bumped into and there was no um, injuries or citations issued. Um, the traffic volume data currently there's about 13,000 vehicles a day through that intersection. Um, about 1,100 are trucks. Um, the engineering study that we had commissioned um, estimated that in the next uh, 20 years that those volumes could approximately double with 26,000 vehicles through the intersection and approximately 22,000 trucks. Um, this, this shows the, the current intersection aerial view. Um, as you see, the, the median stopped short of the crosswalks. Um, if you were to cross um, Saguaro Boulevard, it's currently about 95 feet. And if you were to cross the Avenue of Fountains from sidewalk to sidewalk, um, it's approximately 130 to 135 feet. Um, the three-way stop that, that we looked at, that the engineering study looked at, is basically the current configuration, but we push the, uh, the medians out further, um, kind of creates an area of refuge um, for pedestrians. It also shortens the turning distances for the vehicle so they can get through the intersection a little quicker. Um, right now, the intersection operates at about a level of service B. And what, what that means is that if you look at the chart to the lower right, that the, um, the vehicles get through there in about 10 to 15 seconds. Um, if you go project that out to the 20-year um, projections with 26,000 vehicles going through that intersection per day. Um, you come up with the peak PM, which I believe is 4.30 to 5.30 PM is our peak hour of traffic. And that could get up to 20, a little over 25 um, seconds per, for a vehicle to get through there. And that barely, barely puts it into the level of service D. Um, the three-way stop, when we, when we look at this, um, there was a discussion about the roundabout. So we wanted to get everything in apples and apples. So we took it from Paul Norton to Parkview. Um, this configuration is currently included in the um, capital improvement plan, which is the next item on the agenda. And that's the uh, $8.2 million bond for tomorrow. So this work is included in that $8.2 million. Um, if we took um, Saguaro and we reconstructed it and we took out the um, 10 inches of asphalt and subgrade and then we, we brought it back, back up with engineered subgrade and, and 4 inches of asphalt, um, did, the did the work at the intersection, 
Um, we're showing possibly, you know, redoing the fountain that's out there right now. Um, some little bit of asphalt replacement up onto Saguaro, um, extending out those medians. If we go from Powell Norton to Parkview, that cost is estimated at $420,000. And that, and that originally was 150000 but because you're going all the way out and showing the whole... Correct. Thing, that's what you're adding into it. Now. Correct. Just, just the intersection alone, we were budgeting $150,000. But when you add the asphalt replacement and the curb and gutter replacement from, from Powell Norton to Parkview, that's what jumps it up to the $420,000. Um, the, the engineer, Aztec Engineering, looked at the single lane roundabout and... Um, they projected out that it'll handle the volume of traffic out to about 15 years, could become over, a little bit overwhelmed in the um, PM peak hour with about a 112 second delay. That was kind of subjective because you don't know if you put a roundabout in, if people are going to find alternate routes if they happen not to prefer going through it. So that, that's just their, that's just their projection on the um, peak PM for the 2031. When we take this same roundabout and put it in from Paul Norton to Parkview, this is kind of the line work that the engineer did. Um, we also included the on-street parking from Paul Norton to Parkview. Uh, we included the asphalt removal and replacement. Um, you'll have to reconfigure the, the medians um, as you approach the Avenue Fountains north and southbound on Saguaro. Um, there is the potential to have to eliminate the first um, set of parking spots um, on going westbound on the avenue because you're, you're going to have, you'd have cars backing out right next to that roundabout that has somewhat free, free flow traffic. Um, potential issue, we would have to have an engineer look at that more closely if we, if we go this route and go into design. Um, the other issue is um, the drainage. Right now, all the, all the water comes down the avenue. It, it flows towards the center median, comes down, and then when it hits the water, it'll go east or west. Um, there's a concrete uh, valley gutter out there. Um, we're just projecting possibly having to put um, a new drainage system out there to collect that water before it does hit the roundabout. So we made allowances for that. Um, the downtown vision plan also called for, on, for um, pedestrian lighting, so we're including that. And then also, um, it is recommended that if you put a roundabout in, that you put light poles, larger light poles at the intersection to light the intersection. Okay. Uh, Council Member Jason, do I have a question about the lights? Because we got a letter from somebody um, mm -hmm. about the 35 foot mm -hmm. light pole. So, could you explain why that would have to be in the roundabout option? And then, why would the pedestrian lights? Um, why would we only have those with the roundabout if it's, and not have it with the other configuration, or do we? Um, Mayor, Council Member Dickey, um, to answer the, the pedestrian lighting, uh, that, that's due to the on-street parking. Um, this is our major arterial, and if you have potentially 26,000 vehicles per day, um, we would recommend that we, we light that so people are walking out to get into their cars that the passive drivers can see them. Um, oh, Paul, sorry. So if we had even had the three-way stop, but we had parking, we would need lights? Um, we would recommend, staff would recommend doing that, yes. Okay. Current configuration does not have on-street parking with the three-way stop. Um, and then the 35-foot light poles, you would want to light the roundabout at night so people can actually see their path of travel as they make that turn around the roundabout. And that's your cost there once? Yeah, when we take it from Paul Norton to Parkview, the, the estimated cost is a little over $1.1 million. So it's, it's approximately $700,000 more than what, would, is in, that what we're showing currently in the bond proposal. Yeah. Paul, thank you. Paul, what, what expense is for, for, this, for the roundabout? What expense is it, um, the light? What are the... Excuse me, how much of the light cost? Correct. We, we looked at isolating it, and I don't have it in front of me right now, but w when you do the roundabout, you're no matter what you do on street parking or not, you're going to have to come away from that intersection a little bit. So we 
it's, it's, it's difficult to break it out in exact numbers because some work will overlap. And that was kind of the confusion in the original Aztec report because some of the on-street parking cost is included in the roundup when they, they kind of double counted some things. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the on-street parking and the lighting, I believe, um, was in the 400,000 range. So if we didn't have the on-street parking, but we had the lighting around the roundabout, do you have an idea what the anticipated cost would be then? Um, if you didn't have the on-street, didn't have the on-street parking, um, you, you kind of you change the configuration of the roundabout a little bit. So I guess when if you had to put me on the spot, you know, I would I would say. Did you want lighting or no lighting? Well, what I'm Just lighting at the roundabout? What, I, what I'm getting at, Paul, is when we're talking about the intersection and Correct. the roundabout, and then when we're talking about the roundabout, we're including Long Street parking, the lighting, and everything like that, and we're trying to you know, make sure that we're talking about you know, as far as the configuration mm -hmm. of that intersection and comparing apples it. To apples. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Because we're talking about, well, this lighting we may need, or, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's like we're real firm on it. That's why yeah, it's really hard to do apples to apples because some of that stuff does overlap. Um, if you had to put me on the spot, I would say about six or, well, because the asphalt, the asphalt's different. Um, you've got about $300,000 worth of asphalt work, and the on-street parking and lighting is about $400,000, and the roundabout's about $400,000, just in rough terms. But you definitely need the lighting for the roundabout. Just at the, just the four at the roundabout. Yeah, and how, is there any way you can give us an idea how bright that is? It would be your standard, just like you would see at Palisades in Salah right now, there's lights on top of the, mm -hmm. the traffic signal poles. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe to your point, because she was um, concerned with the dark skies, and so, and I know there are lights that you can get that won't mm -hmm. interfere with that quite as much, but you're saying it's the same as already exist somewhere? Well, that would be the recommendation to light the intersection similar to the other signalized intersections we have. So if you go out to Palisades right now, Palisades and Swirl, there's actually street lights on top of the traffic signal poles. Okay, and there was the apples to apples discussion here. I think the drainage is also something that's a little bit, uh, I'm a little unsure why having a roundabout means we need drainage and having a stop, like if, if the water's flowing down having the fountains, I guess I'm still, I know I asked you this before, but I just don't understand why one might require drainage and the other doesn't when the water is flowing down um, having the fountains. It's hard to explain, but you would, you would not know for sure until an engineer actually designed it, did all their topographical survey and, and laid it out. Basically, right now, it all comes down the avenue mm -hmm. and goes left and right. Now you're trying to make it. You're trying to make it go from the middle of the. It all drains towards the center of the avenue, and it comes down and it hits a valley gutter and goes left or right. Now you're trying to make it. You would have to put some funky drainage scupper in there to do it, and it would. Your cars wouldn't like going over it. Not saying it's impossible, but we would have to have an engineer really look at that. So we want to we want to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Funky, is that a new engineer? Funky, yes. Paul, a long question about the lighting. Um, thinking about how dark it is, and you got cars going around. It seems like where the uh, pedestrian crossing is, you would need some lighting there, because because there's no stop signs. So you would need something bright enough so that those cars coming around can see someone in the crosswalk. Co correct. You might add one or two pedestrian lights on either side, or it could be configured that the round that the lights at the roundabout would be enough. Obviously, a lighting type engineer would look at that during design. But it would have to be the whole inter the whole intersection would have to be bright enough so that cars going around would be able to see train, cars, whatever, and that the both crosswalks would have to be lit enough that cars could see people crossing. That would be staff recommendation, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, the, uh, the freeway stops contemplating additional lighting as well, correct? Uh, no, it does not. Yeah, what are the uh, red dots there that you have on there? 
the, the stop signs. Well, I see the stop signs there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you have one in the... Uh, is that in the median? Is that a stop, supposed to be a stop Correct. The, small, the smaller red dots are all the stop signs. They're just some arrows pointed to them with a larger stop sign depicting what they are. So your opinion as an engineer, we don't need additional lighting in that area for pedestrians that are crossing at a three-way stop? It's pretty much the, it's the same situation right now. The, the cars will be coming to a stop at a T intersection, not going around or roundabout. So no lighting now? Correct. Okay. All right. Go on then. Um, again, we, we looked at the, uh, the dual lane roundabout option as well, and this does um, handle the future volume of traffic better. Um, it will operate basically at a level of service A with minimal delays in the future. And then when we took this option and we did some cost estimates, it's, a little, it's slightly higher than the, um, the single lane just because there's more asphalt work, more curb and reconfiguring uh, medium. So, 1.25 million for that. And again, that's, that would be approximately the 830,000 more than the, than the uh, three-way stop option. I have a question. Uh, are either of these roundabouts encroaching on the park? Um, yes, they do, slightly. Um, what we did is if, if we were going to be redoing the sidewalks in that area, we would actually bring the one right next to the park in the roundabout out wider. So it would create almost like a viewing deck um, for the lake and the fountain. You could, you're going to be doing some retaining wall work anyway. So we thought, you might, you know, if we're going to do it, we'll do it right. Um, create an area where we can put some viewing and some fence, you know, some fence up and we could put some picnic tables or something out there. Um, but my concern was encroaching on the park with heritage funds. Don't we have to do some applications for that? The this thought was to with the viewing area we are creating an amenity for the park. But the road is still encroaching. The road is not. The road is not. It pushes the sidewalk out into the actual asphalt and curb is not. It's pushing the sidewalk out. Okay. You just looked in the dual lane one like it was going into the park? Um, it's hard It's hard to see the line work. It, it's very close. Again, that's, you know, something we need to work through with an engineer if we do actually move forward with a design. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you about the size of the roundabout itself. Um, I know on Cactus they have a rather small one, mm -hmm. and I know that trucks and buses have a little trouble on that one. If you go down to see it, and I know you did, you can see there's a lot of tire marks on that center circle, which shows that sure. there's, there's a time when they're missing it. And this looks like um, it might be kind of small also. Um, I believe the, the engineering study, when they laid the, these um, schematics out, they used a, what's called a, I think they used a wheelbase 65, 65 foot truck. Mm -hmm. So that that should be able to handle your your larger trucks that would be going through here, the semis that go to the post office or, or other deliveries. Because that is a truck route. Correct. And we do get and, and basically the, the dual lane roundabout and the single lane roundabout area-wise are about the same. The dual lane roundabout, the center island gets smaller um, and you have to do a little bit of reconfiguration more of the, of the median. So that's where you pick, you pick up more asphalt and you pick up more work with the medians. So that's why the cost comes up. Just, just so I can get an idea of the size um, in comparison to the one that's on Cactus, is this about the same uh, size? Is it larger? I didn't, I didn't compare it to the one. that one I didn't compare, small. Yeah, I didn't compare it to the one on Cactus. Again, Cactus is a residential collector street. This is going to be an arterial truck route. Okay. Does anyone have anything to so, Okay, can we go on? We're good. Um, so when we, when we look at these, the three different options, um, the level of service, the overall level of service of the three-way stop and the single lane roundabout are about the same. Uh, the dual lane roundabout will give you a better level of service. Um, talking with the, um, the fire department, they, they didn't really have a one way or the other that you know right now I, I was at the intersection the other day when a emergency vehicle came through and everybody was got it got over quickly so 
The current configuration worked and the, round, the fire department didn't have any problems with the roundabout either. Um, the pedestrian connectivity, the, the three-way stop, well, you're going to have to, the cars are going to stop and they're supposed to give the right of way to the pedestrians. Hopefully it happens. Haven't had any accidents that we have recorded. Um, in the roundabout option, there's, you, you minimize the length, um, but then again, it's the, the pedestrian looking and also the, the cars, if they actually do a full circle, come around there. Um, the experts will tell you that roundabouts are safe for pedestrians, so I'm not going to argue their data, but that's what they'll say. Yeah, that's what they'll say. Um, there's, there's no right of way required for the, um, the three way stop configuration. There's minimal right of way required for the roundabouts, and mainly that's again pushing the sidewalk out. Um, touched on the uh, emergency vehicles. The aesthetics, um, three way stop will be the similar configuration that you see out there today. We'll just redo the medians. Um, the roundabouts, you'll, you'll have to do, um, You'll have a center island where you can do some landscaping or artwork. Um, we would recommend that we add lights out there for visibility at night. Um, for utilities, there, there's really no utility impacts if we redo the existing configuration. Um, the one main issue that we have with the roundabout option is if we do have to do drainage, um, there's, a, there's a large SRP duct bank that runs through there. There's, you know, there's a lot of water, gas. Uh, gravity sewer. So when we come across, if we have to come across with a pipe into the park, we need to make sure that we go down. I believe the sewer is about 10, 8 to 10 feet deep. It's a gravity sewer there. So we need to make sure we're underneath that. Um, the projected cost, again, that's from Paul Norton to Parkview um, with the three way stop is the 420,000. Um, the single lane roundabout is the 1.12 million, and that's Roughly seven hundred thousand dollars more than the than the three way stop, and then the dual lane roundabout is about eight hundred thirty thousand dollars more than that. So if we do the right now, the the capital project, the capital improvement plan covers the three way stop option. If council were to choose one of the other options, then we'll need to talk about the funding that we need. To, you might have to move some projects around. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any other questions for Paul? I know we have quite a few speaker cards, so do you have something now? Can we go to the speaker? I like to go to the speaker cards first since a lot of people have been waiting, and you can take a break, and then we'll get back to council discussion. Okay, we have 24 cards. We have 12 who wish to speak and 12 who do not wish to speak, mm -hmm. um, but they wanted the council to know they were against the own bus. So how many? We're against that don't want to speak? Twelve. Twelve. Okay. Twelve and twelve. Okay. Um, Susan Quirn, uh, followed by Murray, Murray Corp. Hi. I've never done this. <laughs> okay. um, my name is Susan Quirn. I'm a resident of Fountain Hills. Can you put, put the microphone? I'm a resident of Fountain Hills. I lived here for five years, then we moved away to three cities for two years, and we just came back last fall. Um, I've lived in a lot of cities in the North American continent that have roundabouts. I think they're confusing for people if they're not used to them. And I think that we have a lot of residents um, that are here part-time. They come from cities where there aren't roundabouts. I think we're looking for more accidents to happen. Um, I think they're less safe for pedestrians. Uh, the people are continuously moving um, instead of stopping and having a thought, you know, about, oh, is there someone crossing the street? Um, I, I don't see them as being safer. I think they're unsafer pedestrians. Um, I've, I've lived outside the country. I've driven in roundabouts outside the country. You have to be really good with a. <laughs> I mean, even a. You know, this only has an intersection of three places. Um, but I find that at La Martania and Avenue of the Fountains, ever since they put the lines in with the left-hand arrow, mm -hmm. people are constantly going through the stop sign when you're making your left turn, and that was confusing. I can't even imagine how they'll handle 
a roundabout in Fountain Hills. Uh, it just doesn't, I, I think it's um, borrowing trouble. I would feel safer if there weren't one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Murray Corp. Yeah, good evening. I'm Maury Corp. Uh, I have been a, a, a taxpayer here in Fountain Hill since 1995 and a taxpayer and a voter since 2003. Uh, I'm representing 39 folks, including myself, who believe that this should be put to a vote by the taxpayers and not the decision of our majority of council. Um, it's controversial, it's costly. Um, the whole thing is questionable as to the goods and the bads, and that debate will continue forever and ever, you know, because we can have dueling witnesses and experts until cows come home. So therefore, my people ask that you, as our elected council people, put this on the ballot and put it to a vote and let the taxpayers and the voters decide that they want to spend this kind of money for a constitutional <coughs> project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bob Deppy, followed by Nancy Ordowski. Hello, I'm my name is Bob Deppy. I've lived here about 11 years. Uh, I've got basically two things to say. Uh, first of all, everything I've heard positive about roundabouts came from progressive government employees or government subcontractors. Uh, who tell me that they know what I need and what I want, and therefore I should not question their knowledge or decision. Everything I've heard negative about the roundabouts came from ordinary citizens who had experience with roundabouts and do not have any, repeat, any friends who like roundabouts. I fell, into the, I fell into this category. I can't tell you how many times I have been stuck behind a person who does not know who has the right of way. Or who, is, or is afraid to merge into traffic. A lot of people avoid the freeways simply because they don't want to merge traffic. And here you create another situation uh, which people tend to avoid if they know about it ahead of time. Um, I also believe I belong to a number of organizations, and we have discussed the merits of the roundabouts and all of them, and I have yet to hear someone who likes them. Uh, secondly, uh, roundabout costs were originally considered as part of the upcoming bond issue, but were pulled out by council, so we could not vote on it. Do you think no one would notice? Just how stupid do you think we are? Uh, let's be realistic. If the Sawara bond issue is not passed, then the roundabout will not be built. If a roundabout is approved tonight without being in the... Uh, uh, bond is, upcoming bond issue, then my friends and I will make sure that the council of deception is well publicized and that the Sora bond issue is voted down again. Again, it's time to listen to the people who are here tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Nancy Ordowski, followed by Jerry Kirkendall. Good evening, Mayor, Council. My name is Nancy Rodowski. Um, I'm a Fountain Hills resident and have been for over 14 years. If a roundabout, a roundabout is um, added to the Saguaro and Avenue of Fountains, it should only be, be, be because the voters have spoken and want a roundabout. And what they had make a decision about how they want their tax dollars spent. It costs no more to have two bond issues on the November ballot. First, one for $8.2 million for the repair of Saguaro, and second, the $1.1 to $1.5 million for a roundabout. You'll know then what the citizens want. The Swaback plan and downtown area specific plans were already paid for with our tax dollars by council vote. They are concepts. And even though the council in 09 voted to accept these concepts, the voters had no say. Now, and if necessary in November, it's time for us to speak out. First, Saguaro is the main street that handles truck traffic to our local businesses. Recently, I've had the opportunity to use several roundabouts out of state and in town, or in, uh, on Cactus and Scottsdale. In all situations, 
the traffic, um, the truck traffic left marks on the upper levels of those roundabouts. And some of these roundabouts were entrances to major expressways. They were not in a downtown area or a residential area where we are speaking of um, when we talk about um, Scottsdale. <clears throat> they leave those marks because the trucks cannot make the tight turns. Two, pedestrians cannot safely cross from park to town, businesses, and back and forth again. It's a hazard for bicycles and motorcycle riders, both of which bring many riders to town when they shop and eat in our local businesses. We don't force, we don't have the tax dollars to spend if, and I say if, we have extra money. They should be placed in our rainy day fund or used for additional road repair. Fifth, other states are being sued, and I have documentation here, by, for the use of roundabouts because they are a hazard for special needs individuals. I could see one, someone trying to cross on the south side and a car entering on the north side, not seeing a walker and an accident occurring. Who would be sued then? The town? And we, the taxpayers, would end up paying yet never having a chance to have voted. I do not support the idea of a pretty roundabout on our, or any roundabout. I believe it is your responsibility to be up front and at least let the voters decide if you as a council feel you have to vote for a roundabout. Susan Ashton, next. Jerry Kirkendall, followed by Richard Rakowski. Good evening, Jerry Kirkendall. Um, almost everything's been said, I think. It's pretty obvious people don't want it. Uh, in my business, at least four out of five, or actually a lot more probably, do not want it. They've been places they had them, they don't like them. I'm not saying everybody, but most of them definitely don't want it. And I have even had people say they're afraid to vote for bonds in this town because they'll go spend a lot of money on a roundabout. Another thing, it costs more. This town's hurting for money. We don't have it. I, I, I don't see what... We're, uh, they keep going, coming back to this roundabout thing. I have been turning left on that street, going to work every day for over 30 years. I have never had to wait more than a minute, probably. I don't know what the big problem is about wanting a roundabout. Um, and I, nothing, uh, the way I was reading the paper today, I'm not sure that it says something about using our downtown money for that or something. That is not what that downtown money was for. We upped our taxes so we could, you know, use the, the media and another thing that they weren't even going to do anyway in the media, the media fix up. We need lights out there. We could have events going on in May and October at night so the local people get used to coming downtown and have to come down and do something. Uh, our Thursday thing we have is only good for tourists. It's not even for the, the locals can't do it. They're at work. I, I think we, we just don't have the whole concept right here. Another, another, I guess that's it. One small thing, last time I was here, I brought up the idea of being business friendly. A few days after that, they closed down the street on us a day early on the, on the fair and didn't tell us. That's not business friendly. And even now that they did tell us, which is good, at least the time it was in the paper the day before, they still closed it down before noon. They don't really get the concept of business friendly. And uh, I have a whole lot of things on that, but I'd take too long. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Richard Rutowski, followed by Ronald Smith. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council. Uh, my name is Rich Rutkowski. I'm a 12-year resident of the town. Uh, I'm here to voice my opposition to this propo proposed roundabout. I have several concerns about it. First, pedestrian safety. Having driven and walked through roundabouts in several states, I'm not conv convinced that pedestrian or vehicle safety is improved by those. Uh, my observations indicate it's quite the opposite. Whereas the President's st stop sign has vehicles stopping and is giving pedestrians a chance to cross the wall and avenue the fountains, the roundabout does not have vehicle stopping. In fact, the main purpose of a roundabout, as my understanding, is to keep traffic moving and eliminate a traffic signal at an intersection. Second, traffic flow. Large trucks are needed for many of the businesses in town, and we've spoken about that. Uh, semis, you know, I've observed semis, and, and going around the roundabout, you know, maybe two-thirds of the way, three-fourths around, I can't see how they can not violate the curb or if it's a two-lane, violate the other lane and potentially cause an accident with the vehicle next to them. 
so neither one of these options is safe, and impeding truck traffic that is essential for business in town should be avoided, not created. Third, vehicle safety. Uh, my observation is that many, if not most, drivers are not comfortable with roundabout etiquette. That is the proper way to negotiate it, the right of way, etc. Especially when distracted driving is already a prevalent in our society, why add another element to this? Lastly, the cost. We're told the town doesn't have funds for basic street maintenance. Uh, extending meetings at the intersection uh, to provide added safety for pedestrians can cost either 150000 420 depending on what numbers we uh, go by. The cost of the roundabout, as we've seen, is well over $1 million. When our funds are scarce, this extra spending is not logical. It's not fiscally responsible stewardship of our money. So my request is either vote against the roundabout or at least refer to the voters for their decision. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Next, Ronald Smith, followed by Steve Ryan. Mayor, council members. My name is Ronald Smith. I purchased my lot in 1975. I moved here in 1993 after I retired. And I'm opposition to the roundabout. First of all, I think the roundabout is too expensive. Secondly, you have two proposals. The first one is a single lane roundabout. It narrows the traffic from two lanes to one lane. It's a long period of flow. You're going to have an emergency vehicle with sirens going and lights going, trying to get through that intersection, and there's going to be cars in front of them, and they're not going to be able to get it away. Where are they going to go? How is the fire truck going to get through? I have personal experience in driving a police car, 28 years. I know people panic when you get behind them, and they see the lights, and they hear the siren. They don't know where to go. If there's nowhere for them to go, what are they going to do? It's just going to block the roadway. You put in the two lanes, it's going to be much more expensive than the one lane. And we don't need the expense. Let the voters vote on it, they'll be against it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronald. Next. Steve Ryan, followed by Linda Bordeaux. Members of the council, my name is Steve Ryan, 13-year resident of Fountain Hills. Um, I've got about three minutes of thoughts uh, in the roundabout, and I apologize at the outset for probably repeating an awful lot of what you've heard. The Insurance Institute of Highway Safety suggests that roundabouts are safer than traditional intersections due to reduced speed and the single direction of traffic flow. They further assert that roundabouts improve capacity, even with reduced speed, by re removing stop signs. However, studies can rarely account for all the unique variables that make up the traffic environment in every intersection. So let's consider some of the unique factors that impact the intersection of uh, Saguaro and Avenue of the Fountains. Number one, the town's plan to functionally connect the Avenue of the Fountains as a future improved park area to Fountain Lake Park will certainly increase pedestrian traffic between the two park areas and therefore change the conditions of the intersection. The vehicular traffic traveling through the intersection will include a large number of visitors and seasonal residents, all passing by Fountain Lake Park and attempting to not be distracted by one of the tallest fountains in the country. This is clearly not your normal intersection. There's a pedestrian safety issue in the existing controlled intersection, which thankfully has yet to result in a serious injury. However, with the alleged safety improvement from the roundabout, a significant increase in pedestrian crossings between the two park areas would likely increase the potential for pe pedestrian safety issues. Remember, a roundabout relies entirely on yield signs to prevent distracted drivers from causing accidents. Number two, the design of current roundabouts fails to account for the special needs of sight and hearing impaired pedestrians. This has apparently become a significant issue which has led to legal contests around the country over ADA regulations for and civil rights of hearing and sight impaired pedestrians. This is not an issue to be ignored and the solutions are likely to be expensive. Number three, the Fountain Hills 
our community. Fountain Hills has a relatively high median age for its permanent residents and has a large component of seasonal res residents, which further raises the median age statistic. While studies suggest that older drivers do just fine in navigating roundabouts, nothing in the research indicates that the studies account for a significant driver population that experiences roundabouts only on their winter vacation. Number four and lastly, for a meaningful comparison of a roundabout and traditional intersection in this location, there must be a problem to solve and a solution to the problem. There is not currently a serious safety issue in the existing controlled intersection other than for pedestrians being scared witless by distracted drivers. The intersection capacity of measurement assumes the traffic violence will continue to grow, ultimately creating consequential delays. However, Fountain Hills has a very restricted ability to grow, therefore capacity is not likely a future issue. In the absence of any real problems to solve and no apparent solutions offered, for the special pedestrian problems created by the unique park setting, the town might just end up spending over a million dollars trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist, or worse, create a problem that doesn't exist now. The experience installing a roundabout at the intersection of I-17 and Happy Valley Road is instructive. After millions of dollars of investment and a few years of use, millions more dollars were spent removing the roundabout and replacing it with controlled intersections. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Linda Bordeaux, followed by Douglas Larson. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'll be quick about this. Um, I've spoken against the road bond before, and I have to say I agree with everything everyone before me has said. Just a couple points I want to point out. The repaving from Paul Norton Parkway could be should be included in the in the road bond. If you want to extend those medians, that's Saguaro Boulevard. That should be part of the Saguaro Boulevard repaving program. All we're doing is pulling up the medians. So I think that should be part of the road bond. Um, the extension of that intersection would then only be $150,000, period, simple. Um, I noticed at that next uh, agenda item under the capital investments uh, project that we're going to talk about, the fire station, we need to have a new fire station. The fire signs from rural metro are supposed to be between five seconds technically around five seconds, sometimes they go as long as eight. That, that's listed as having a medium priority in the mind of council. The, the roundabout's 1.4 million. We don't need that. The fire station is 2.1 million. That's money that is spent to people's houses who might be on fire, as opposed to driving around in a circle because it looks pretty or whatever. I think that's a better place for that money. Um, the other thing that bothers me is that the restaurants and the businesses that are at the bottom of Avenue of the Fountains, if we did the roundabout, they're going to lose parking spaces there. It's hard enough to park if you want to go to the American Grill, especially, you know, if you're like me. I have broad spikes and screws in my ankle. You know, I, have, I want the shortest walk possible to get to where I'm going. And if I lose five or eight parking spaces in front of my business, you know, there's only so much street there these people can park on. Um, and the other thing I thought was odd, I'm not sure why the study shows that we're going to have an increase of 26,000 cars over the next 20 years. Our town is shrinking. It shrunk by 2,000 over the 2010 census. I think we'd do well to keep what we have now and maybe gain a few more. So I'm not so sure that that figure of 26,000 vehicles a day is where we're going to be in 20 years. I, I hope so, but I think that's a long shot. And that's probably enough said. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Linda. Douglas Larson, followed by James Chen. My name is Doug Larson. I've been here since 1988. I hate roundabouts. <laughs> I avoid them like the plague. I will not drive on Cactus Boulevard because of the roundabouts. I became very angry the last time I drove to Sedona because they put them in there. Uh, every morning I drive down the avenue of the fountains to the dog park. And on the way back, I go up the avenue of the fountains. I drive by all the businesses there. I enjoy the Christmas lights. I enjoy the fountain. If you put a roundabout in there, I will never, again, drive up the avenue of the fountains by all those businesses. And I don't know if there's any businessmen here, but I know I go through, I see all the businesses. When I think about, okay, I want to go buy something, I think about those businesses on avenue of the fountains. And you're going to drive people away from those businesses because 
I'm sure there's many people like me who avoid, like the plague, roundabouts. And, I, you know, and it makes no sense. And the, the money thing is just, it should just be based on the money. It's just nuts. And uh, like say, that one they, they put in out there on Happy Valley Road, a million dollars, take them out. And if anybody thinks it's a neat idea to help traffic flow, I will get a 40-foot motorhome, put a 25-foot car trailer on it, and I'll drive around that circle, and you can drive around there with me, with it, see how you like it. That's a terrible idea. Terrible idea. Thank you. James Heron, followed by the last speaker, Judy Rakowski. Jim Heron, Mayor, House of Um I'm worried about the unintended consequences of, of the roundabout. I uh, just did some simple research, and you know, I found out that in Florida, they found that with bicycles, it was a problem. There was a study done in Europe where they looked at 90 roundabouts in Belgium before and after. And there was a significant increase in bicycle accidents, serious. And uh, basically, the study said that it was worse with bicycle lanes in there because drivers, again, are distracted or whatever. So um, this report was given at the uh, National Roundabout Conference in Kansas City, Missouri, 2008. If Paul wants to look at the, the thing I brought up, I, I wasn't going to print out uh, 18 pages for all the council members, so I'm sorry. But, um, yeah, I think that the, uh, the problem would be is that uh, if we start having bicycle accidents, we're, we're going to get sued. And, um, you know, so thank you. All right, thank you. Maybe the last speaker is Judy Rakowski. So far, there's a lot of things I've heard that I haven't even considered, so I hope that everybody's getting the message. Um, and I've never done this before, so, you know, Kavanaugh Council members. I'm Judy Rakowski. I've lived here for 12 years, um, and we plan to move, we actually made that plan to move here um, to Fountain Hills. We didn't get moved here, and we plan to stay here, and I really don't want to see a roundabout. Um, and I'm just going to read my letter because... I want to include everything that um, somebody spoke about Sedona. I know Sedona was mentioned in the newspaper on the roundabout, and we have made many trips to Sedona before and after the roundabout. My observations are that there is an impediment of the traffic because the drivers are hesitant to move into the roundabout. They're trying to merge off into whatever direction they're wanting to go. And um, a roundabout doesn't have a stop sign or a stop, so they are just yielding in there. And then there's the pedestrians that need to also cross. And when you're worried so much about getting in there and how you're going to use that roundabout, I think that affects, I don't care how many studies are done, for me, that affects um, pedestrians crossing and increases the uh, state, uh it does, it decreases the safety. And I have driven in them in Sedona, and I've also been the pedestrian. And they don't stop, they're yielding in to that roundabout. So that's number one. So attempting to cross with roundabouts to me, it's not safe. Um, so I said that, and then also bicycles. Somebody mentioned the bicycles, and I'm glad because that's what I have in uh, my notes, too. As far as uh, the bicycles, they have to follow the rules of the road, but when they're getting in there in the roundabouts, there's a lot of distraction. There's distraction anyway without roundabouts. There's distraction when I'm driving to Rio Verde with the bicycles, even though they have the bicycle lane. So I can't imagine the, this, what the distraction would be with a roundabout. Um, somebody talked about large trucks already, and I totally agree with that. The large trucks, the large vehicles, uh, you know, the length of them, and it's, it's, it's a tight squeeze there. And then if you do have the double lanes, just agreeing with that, that, you know, that may, they may go over into the other person's lane. 
Um, and safety aside, um, it's taxpayer money. And I'm not sure that this is the way taxpayer money should be spent. I don't think, I don't see this as a need. Um, it may be pretty, but it's not a need. Uh, so my vote would be against the roundabout. My vote would be for extending the medium. And also, and I don't think that this is, as we've talked about, on um, an item on the list, but I think that there should be some kind of uh, flashing lights to denote that there's a pedestrian in the waiting area, in the in the waiting area, or that uh, to denote that pedestrians are, are crossing that crosswalk. I think that's some kind of an extra flasher. Um, I know in um, when we lived in Illinois that when police or fire vehicles were coming through, um, you don't always see the lights and you don't always hear the sirens, but at the traffic lights, there was a, a white flasher that would go on, and you would know that there is an emergency vehicle in the way or coming through. I think there should be some sort of a flashing light or something like that, and I know that's not been mentioned, but there's got to be a way for those pedestrians to stop, or those cars to stop, but also we have to enforce that, too. The laws have to be enforced. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mayor. Anyone else? No, ma'am. No. Okay. Council? Mayor. Anything? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Uh, for, first and foremost, um, I'd like to thank um, everyone that has provided feedback and input on this um, on this topic. Um, unfortunately, I've received more emails than I could answer, so I'm kind of putting that out to the people that aren't here that I didn't respond to and I typically do respond to. Um, I've heard pros, I've heard cons, uh, through email and line at Safeway, uh, phone calls, so forth and so on. You know, one thing I would like to clarify, then I'm going to make a comment and I'm going to make a motion. One thing I'd like to comment on, the discussion we've had up here around the bond is for a $4.2 million bond. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> You like the fact that I just cut it in half, yeah. We've talked about an $8.2 million bond, and that bond basically is included in the bond package and all the discussion we've had, the modified three-way stop sign at Saguaro in the intersection of the Avenue of the Fountains. I wanted to mention that because at no time did that bond ever include a roundabout. A roundabout has been an ancillary discussion because it's been something that's been talked about through strategic planning. It's been talked about through um, vision planning and the downtown master plan, so forth and so on. So as a council, we have a fiduciary responsibility to not only address your needs, but people that aren't here this evening. So we've talked about it as an ancillary discussion. And I want to make something perfectly clear, and this is not intended to be disrespectful. There has been no deception, and I take that personally. What we did talk about, if we did do something other than a three-way stop sign that is included in the current bond package, and every conversation we've had about it, we talked about the possibility of taking that cost of the intersection out and possibly looking for another uh, source of funding. There's no deception there. As a matter of fact, if we did do that, it would lower the cost of the bond by about $400,000, $500,000 to a million, which would mean your burden as taxpayers would be, be lower. That's neither there nor there. We never, ever talked about adding the um, roundabout to, to the bond, and there has been no deception there. Now, getting on to my comment, and I'd like to make a motion. You know, whether a roundabout at the intersection is the appropriate solution or not, you know, or if the timing is appropriate, you know, that's debatable. And as the gentleman said this evening, we could debate that until the cows come home. To my advantage or disadvantage, I grew up in New England, the land of roundabouts. And what I found is many of them work very well, and many of them didn't work, and it all depends on how you apply the intervention. 
Nonetheless, from a certain perspective, a lot of this conversation is somewhat academic. It's academic because we have never targeted in our capital plan money for a roundabout. So hence, I'm not sure where the deception comes from. We've talked about it in problem solving. With respect to funding in the capital improvement plan, there is no money targeted for that. There is no money targeted in the downtown fund. So the bottom line at the end of the day, currently today as we stand, there is not money available to fund this particular project. And it is a project. Whether we ever go there or not, who knows. And the reason I mention that is because we are looking at another controversial project, which is a median project, which is moving forward. And if we move forward with that, that's basically going to tap most of the downtown money. So therefore, I'm not sure where the money for this would, would come from. So Mayor, cutting to the chase, at this time I'd like to move to maintain the modified three-way stop intervention currently being proposed in our projected bond package. One that has always been there and still remains in our projected bond package. That is my motion. Second. Council discussion? Yes, ma'am. Paul? Thought you were done, huh? Paul, there, one, of the, uh, one of the discussions which kind of prompted, I guess, to some degree the roundabout was on-street parking. On-street parking being on the east side of uh, Saguaro, mm -hmm. so it would provide easy access or easier access to the park. Uh, that's something that was shared by fellow council members, and we've discussed that. In the situation where if we have a three-way stop there, are there s scenarios where we could have on-street parking in the direction of El Lago Palisades to provide for more access? Uh, Mayor, members of the council, it's, it's very difficult is, is kind of the answer because you would then have to create a lane for parking a, a bike lane, and then you could no longer, it would be very tight to squeeze two lanes of traffic in there. And there was a scenario with a three-way stop with on-street parking and only one lane. Mm -hmm. And I can, off the top of my head, I don't remember the fire. delays, but the delays were way out, way out there. I think fire didn't like that. And fire did not like that either, going down one lane. Okay, so based on... What you know with a three-way stop on street parking is just not a feasible option on Saguaro. Unless you really reconfigured it and got rid of the medians. Right. And, well, we and kept shifting it. everything. Right. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilwoman Dickey? Mayor oh, Hayes. Oh, you want to go, Sassy? No. Okay. Um, just to get kind of about when some people mentioned about... Um, solving a problem and things like that, I just wanted to go a little bit backwards on what the goal was of, you know, you, somebody mentioned the area-specific plan, the downtown plan, the swabback, you know, how we always had the pictures of it all over here. And, indeed, that that goal was for that to become a traffic calming area, for it to be pedestrian-friendly. Um, the sidewalks were part of the plan. The, the swabback plan, the area-specific plan, was something that was very well vetted, as you all know. Um, eventually approved by the council in December of 2009. Then in May of um, 2010, the, uh, the, the general plan was approved by voters. And in the general plan, we had um, one, of the, one of the five or six different areas was called circulation. And in that, um, they talked about studying pedestrian and vehicular traffic and those kind of things. And um, one of them said that neighborhood uh, traffic control plans should be monitored. Um, and then traffic, sorry, traffic calming measures, including speed humps, speed tables, roundabouts, and other appropriate measures should be implemented in accordance with the town's adopted plan. So, and that was voter approved. And I understand that the general plan is a big plan and has a lot of stuff in it. And, and so, but just to, to try to get away from some of the like feelings like of what the reasoning is behind this, the the, the swabback plan very well vetted. Many people up here and in the community involved in that. Council 
help pay for that with the chamber, so it was deemed something worth pursuing, and then this was the product. So the product comes back, and, you know, we, we should at least take that into consideration. We have studies done, and we have expertise that we think we should pay for, then when we get that product, like the Aztec study, which, which their um, recommendation in 2011 was for the roundup. So, so th this isn't something just kind of pulled out of anywhere. It's literally in our, our um, general plan. Talk about the area-specific plan and the swab act and said that voters didn't have an opportunity for that. The area-specific plan is part of the general plan and voters approved that in May. So just, just trying to get a little bit of, of perspective and where some of these things come from. Is, is it the goal to try to progress with these items that were in there, including pedestrian safety, including, um, which is debatable, I understand, but, you know, really um, connectivity, traffic calming. So really, the, the goal in those studies was not so that traffic zoom through there and maybe it actually would make people divert and that becomes your downtown kind of, you know, Sedona area where people are crossing and you're looking, but it's really not for traffic. This, this presentation here is more about getting cars through and that kind of stuff. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem like the downtown area fund, the general plan, downtown area plan, the general plan, voter approved, was part of the discussion coming up with these with these, and that's fine. Uh, last thing for Andrew is um, a lot of people would like us to put it on the ballot, and I know that um, that has, comes up in the past, and when you're a general, um, oops, what do you call it, general law city, you don't, have a contract, you don't have a contracted city, so there are certain rules that say things you can't, actually can't. You cannot have advisory elections on certain issues. This one's a little different because there's a little bit of a chance um, if it has something to do with transportation, but it's kind of vague. So I don't know if Andrew, if you wanted to talk a little bit about that, so that if in the if in the future this is something that we do want to put on the ballot, there may be a chance that we can. But to know that it, there are a lot of reasons uh, that that we were talking like we couldn't, and that and that was why. Madam Mayor, members of the council, the um, the. The concept that Councilmember Dickey is referring to is that general law towns only have the powers that are specifically granted by the legislature or those necessarily implied. There is no specific grant for advisory elections on virtually any topic except for one. Um, back in 97, the legislature, as part of the monstrous alt fuels bill, included a provision that allows a, a city or town, general law city or town, the ability to put an advisory question relating to public transportation to the vote. Now, we couldn't find when we went digging around in the legislative history of it, including the committee minutes and notes, what anyone meant by public transportation. We know that on the House and Senate side, the report seemed to conflict a little bit, um, but it was never referred to as transit, which is was my concern, is that transit is the one thing that would be defined differently than public transportation generally. We think it's the more global term, including highways, you know, airports, rail, the whole shooting match, but we just don't have any guidance on it. So I think it's probably within your power to send that specific kind of question, if it was a broad-based transportation, street transportation question, to the ballot for an advisory question. And Councilman Hanson, did you want to? Well, and if there wasn't a question, if a dollar amount was attached to that, it would no longer be advisory. It would be asking them for the authority to tax for $100,000, as long as the public was participating with other town funding. Would it no longer be an advisory question? Um, Madam Mayor, Councilman Wright, I think that the, uh, if it went up as a bond question, as a, you know, a specific bond authorization for a certain amount, Absolutely, and then it's, it's no longer advisory and, and you're in the position that you are with the swallow bond that we'll be talking about. So I, I think that's one way to definitely take it out of an advisory election question. I think in this case you wouldn't need to do that. I believe that the statute is broad enough to allow you to do it without attaching a dollar figure and actually making it a bond question. So I think that's a really good opportunity then for 
letting the public at least weigh in on it. And then we would know going forward forever, <laughs> at least in the near future, that that just isn't an option that the community desires to have. It would certainly provide you a, a much stronger sense of certainty in one way or the other on that particular issue. We would have to word it broadly enough that it is you know, global roundabout, not just this intersection, so that we would know that that's what people were talking about, regardless we of the location. We could specify the location, though. I think then you get kind of out of the, the public transportation realm, if it's a specific intersection. I think then we we get to a topic that's probably narrower than what the statute is talking about. But again, we don't have any really good guidance on what the statute was intended to mean. Um, I went back into my notes from the whole clawback exercise, and it, during that discussion, it was quite clear that, and I know what Jenny's referring to on the designs, it looks like there's a circular motion there, but it's really, it's not really a roundabout. It's pavement enhancements to, to look more user-friendly. And the, one of the major parts of their plan was making that a more pedestrian friendly area. It was to truly link the park and the avenue. And the only way you can really do that is to slow the traffic down on Swarrow and to narrow it down. And to narrow it, it doesn't even need to be done with curbs and little medians. I mean, it can be done with striping. And I think that's something that, you know, rather than just making the decision, we're going to extend those medians just a little bit, it's still going to be a very vast area. I and mean, when you look at that first picture up there, and you're looking across Swarrow, it's like it's not welcoming you to cross the street and get to the park. Do you want to say something? Come up here. Do you want to say something? Did you still want to? Did you have to remember where I'm sitting? Okay. And your name is? I'm Renee Jewell. I live in this town since 1977. I live over on Center Peak. And I, as long as I, in the first 10 years, there was one way to get into this town, was to walk Boulevard. Fountain Hills Boulevard wasn't finished, nor was Palisades. Now, I must I, I go out of town a lot to Scottsdale and west of Phoenix, and I tried to come to go, you know, I said, oh, well, don't go on, on Cape Boulevard. I'm going to take Cactus. Well, I then I have, a, I have a Honda Odyssey. I don't have a little car. So I come to this section, and it's, of course, residential. But uh, I must say, you know, I was worried about it too. I kept looking around. If somebody had walk over there and I had to go to on one way to go around this roundabout. And it's very scary. I'm scared to hit somebody. And I really I think it's it's a very it's not a smart idea at all. I hate to say that, but I am honest. I lived long enough in this town, I have a right to speak up. And I believe a light would be proper right there for the people to go. Everybody in the whole nation know when a stop line is, it's a stop sign and you have your button and you can cross over and you're safe. Why are you doing the same system like everybody else does? I don't get it. I'm sorry, but that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Can I go back now? Yes. Yeah. And I wasn't speaking for the roundabout. I was speaking to narrow tomorrow to make it more friendly. Um, this is, I know we talked in the past, I mean, even years back, about the Hawk system. And qu quite frankly, I can't realize, I remember now, why it was said that the Hawk system wouldn't work. And maybe a good reason would be because Swarrow is so wide. Um, if it was narrowed down, the Hawk system might be a viable option to try. And that way, even though it's a single lane going through the intersection, it would it would not it would no longer have the stop signs, but if it had the Hawk system, then a pedestrian could hit the button, then all the traffic would stop. 
So I mean, I just I would like to keep some of those options open so that we're creating something down there that that Wabat was trying to create and make it be equally at least for pedestrians as it is for vehicles. Right now, I think with with a roundabout, it's concentrating more on moving cars rather than moving people. But I think going to the alternative and maybe just doing an experiment in the short term, a temporary thing that we could try for 30 days through striping and some, you know, maybe even some uh, temporary traffic signals that could be, you know, leased, just to try some different configurations, see how the community likes it, see how it affects the traffic. People that are really looking for a straight through shot may find an alternative route and, and just see how it would work out. But that way we're not committing to any one, one particular plan without trying some alternatives to try and, and, and just improve that area and make it more pedestrian friendly. Okay. Well, Mayor. Okay. So, Chief Mayor, <coughs> uh, I wanted to remind the council we're going to have a survey coming in front of us. And obviously, I'd like to put this on there. That would be a very cheap and cheerful way to get some feedback and also to get a, a valid uh, participation from our residents on all the other issues. So I kind of think that might be a better way to go to use, use the resources that we have right now. And then secondly, um, we have a motion. And a second, I'd like to call the question. Oh, I was hoping to comment. I was I'll rescind my calling of the question and yield to the mayor. Everybody go first. Go right ahead. Um, yes, ma'am, if I may, thank you. Um, you know, Cassie, that, that was a good idea regarding the hockey. As a matter of fact, when we um, started looking at a solution for that intersection to make it more uh, pedestrian friendly and traffic friendly, for those of you who live in Fountain Hills for a while, you may recall that we did have yellow blinking lights there at one time, and our observations indicated that no one stopped. And we added a stop sign, and, and it enhanced, I mean, if you eat lunch down at the corner there and you count how many people actually stop, you know, it's just questionable. But people are stopping more. With respect to the Hawk, we did look at the Hawk, and our research went down to Tucson, which is kind of where they invented that technology. And, and Cassie, um, our, our public works officers came back to us and basically said that that's a solution for mid-crossing uh, on, on not an intersection, but just a mid-street crossing. The other thing, too, is if you've gone down to Tucson and you looked at the Hawks, they're, they're view, they obstruct views. There's all this wiring and hardware hanging, and you have to have it at both intersections. And I think at that time we decided that if this was not appropriate for that intersection because we're looking at a T here, not a mid-street crossing. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying um, that was the rationale for, I think, why we, we, moved, we moved away from it. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I've been in town a short 20 years, and I've probably seen four different uh, assemblies of trying to get people across the street and on from Avenue of the Fountains across to the lake, and none of them have been very attractive, and none of them have been very um, successful. I thought about it quite a bit, and I truly believe that this, what we're doing by extending the medians, adjusting the turn radius, onto and off of the uh, avenue, giving the pedestrian someplace truly to stop is probably the best solution that I've seen in in the last, well, since I've lived in Fountain Hills. So I feel like that we have done our job and I'm, I'm satisfied with what we're going to do. Okay, then my final comment, since I think everybody knows how I feel about roundabouts, I haven't made it a secret at past meetings that my research showed that I didn't want one here for most of the reasons that everybody said. Uh, I was I was at the Swabak, um, all of the meetings myself. I was part of that through the Chamber of Commerce. And I, and I clearly, I, I agree with, uh, with Councilman Hansen said that there were pavers put down which sort of designated that intersection. And that's what made it different from the rest of the road so people normally would slow down when they see something like that. It's, it looks more like a big crossing. As far as the roundabout, it was mentioned by the Swabat team 
that if you do put a roundabout in, at some point you may want to put a bridge in because they said that's how you're going to get people across safely when there's a lot of traffic. So that part's never been mentioned, and a, and a bridge would be extremely costly and probably really ugly. Um, I didn't see. I I I would I like um, actually bringing the intersection in tighter and pulling the medians in uh, was was uh, Ken Buchanan came up with that as a solution to the intersection as a, a very cost-effective way of doing it and to um, make it safer. And I thought that at the time that that was a great idea. And um, I I don't. I don't know how we could do something uh, as far as, I won't say pavers or adding something that really costs a lot, but I do like the idea of doing something to just set that intersection apart from the rest of the road, just to say that this is the part where people cross. Um, there is no current real congestion. Most of these roundabouts are put in places where there's a lot of congestion, there are a lot of accidents. So when they put the roundabout in, it comes out, wow, we got less accidents and things are running better. But you got to always say, well, what did you have before? What we have now is really no accidents. The traffic is okay. Nobody has to wait a lot. People can cross. So we can't really say that we have we are like any of those other cases. And we really can't compare ourselves to, um, to Cactus. I went on Cactus at several times of the day. There is traffic congestion when you get to around 5.30, um, a little confusion. It does start to back up. Motorcycles have a tendency to go really fast around them. <laughs> they kind of like to speed. Sorry, Peter. But they do. Um, and also, that is it, that those three there are in the, the, the furthest one west is, is all horse property, and then the other two are residential where there's really big homes. I never saw anybody walking. Nobody walks. Nobody crosses. So it's really just meant for the traffic flow and not um, for pedestrians, which basically is what roundabouts are, to move the traffic, not the people. Um, I was concerned about it being a truck route. All the truck semis go through there, going to the grocery stores. Um, that's our designated truck route, and I wouldn't really want to see trucks going around it. And we are trying to attract more tourism. We would like tour buses to come in. I don't think they would like that either. Um, I, I did have uh, a resident wrote to me about New Jersey, and I have to remember it because I used to live in New Jersey. They used to have quite a few roundabouts there. And I believe by about 1999, they had removed every single one of them and went back to a traditional intersection. But they tried it because they had some major congestion problems, and they still went back because people didn't like it and it really didn't work. So, you know, I think in, in some such situations, you really have to learn from history. And you have to look at situations where people are saying, hey, we tried this and it doesn't work. So, you know, maybe there are certain places, like on Texas, maybe it belongs there. That's a good place because nobody crosses. There's no park. There's only one roundabout there, and that's, I think, the easternmost one where um, it's kind of like a T like ours, only where ours is a T, the T part is a park where people cross to get into the park. This is a gated community. So then again, you're really not going to have a lot of people um, crossing. And, I, you know, I got tons of emails and tons of phone calls. People are really upset about this. This is really very controversial. I got calls from people who are bicyclists, uh, who are concerned about our mountain to fountain and all of our other uh, events that we're trying to encourage bicycles. I talk to people at the stores and, well, you know, they, they would much rather people park down there by their stores if they want to go into the park because they'd like them to pass the stores. And they feel that if people park on the street, they go take a picture of the fountain, they get back in their car and they go, rather than coming down there and going through that archway and getting to the park that way. So some of the businesses that I talked to, they would much rather not have the parking. Um, the Hawk system, I've always liked the Hawk system. I, I, it's a possibility. What I would say is that, and I guess Paul can answer this question, we can lay the infrastructure for future. If we wanted a Hawk system, or in the future we needed a light, 
Is that going to cost a whole lot just to lay in the infrastructure for the future? Uh, uh, Mayor, members of the council, not fairly inexpensive to put the conduits in, but to what Councilmember Leger was saying, a, a hawk system is more for a mid-block crossing. Um, at, at the intersection, it would be more for like a traffic signal. Yeah. And that would be in the ground in the event that 20 years from now, traffic became so congested that something needed to be done, the infrastructure would be there. Do they have lights that could actually be activated by the button if you didn't have a hawk system? Let's say in the future you need a traffic light, but you don't want the traffic light to, you can, you can. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, uh, without being too familiar with all the warrants for a traffic signal, yes. I haven't seen one that's always green and then pedestrian operated. That's more like a hawk system, okay. not a true intersection traffic signal like that. Right, okay. But we could lay the conduit. Yeah, that's fairly inexpensive. And we might want to do something like that, um, thinking of the, um, you know, the future. And just one last comment about speed humps. We had the fire department here who said they put, did $100,000 to their ladder truck when they hit a speed hump because they have to go down, I think they said like, did they say five miles an hour? Something like that. They really have to go down very slowly with the trucks, and that has decreased their response time. So I, I know like some people like them in their neighborhood, but they got to think of getting those fire trucks to their house quickly, and the speed humps are going to slow that down. So I just wanted to make my comments because I, I just waited for everybody else to have their say, and I, I really want to thank everybody for coming out. I think it's just great. Whether you're for or against something, I think it's really great that you took the time to come. Thanks for all the emails and the phone calls, because I really like to hear what's on your mind and what you have to say. And um, I was especially grateful to a lot of people who said they were uh, on, they were engineers, retired engineers, and um, they gave a lot of credence just by their credentials to what they had to say. So, if we are done, we have a motion and a second. Okay, we don't. Yeah. One, before we take the vote. One, one last. Yeah. I came across this today that was very, no, that's okay. But this was done by the U.S. Department of Transportation. It's called TEDSAFE, Pedestrian Safety Guide and Countermeasure Selection System. The honk is actually mentioned in here along with another variety. I mean, they've got Pelican systems. They've got, they've got all kinds of, of systems. Um, and when referring to a light at that intersection, if it's narrowed down, you're not looking at a great big standard with the thing going across. It could be very, it could be actually similar to our new clock that's been installed, something that's pleasing to look at. And my only concern is that if we're just saying, okay, we're going to stay with the two lanes, we're not going to have any parking on Floro, we're just going to make the medians longer, I just, I'm just afraid we're missing an opportunity at this point by not exploring some other options because there are just there's so many different things that could be done that would not be real expensive and I just wanted to say that before the vote. Well, if we write the conduit, can you also do these other systems in the future if we decided that the traffic got to the situation where we need uh, to do something? Uh, or is that uh, strictly traffic light? Uh, Mayor, members of the council, typically at an intersection it would be a a traffic signal. The Hawk system is designed to be green all the time and then goes yellow to red when pushed by a pedestrian. So um, I've never seen a Hawk system at an intersection. Right. Um, but all I'm saying is... But, but yeah, the conduit, if, some, if we want to put something there, yes. If, yep. if we wanted to look at these for Correct. the future, if need be, Correct. laying that down gives us a future that we don't have to rip up the road. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Can I call for the vote? Mayor, I'd like to make a comment, and I certainly um, am interested in, in calling the vote. Um, I forgot what the motion was. It's been so long. Um, but I, I, w I, I would, I, I know I made the motion. Um, I would like to make a comment about traffic signals. We have one at El Lago. You want to put one at the Avenue of the Fountain and have one at Palisades? No. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm not sure we want to spend money putting the infrastructure in. Unfortunately, I've sat here for too many years, and for those of us that have been here for a few years, you remember that discussion. You think the house is full now, when we want to put a traffic signal there, I mean, it was, it was, you guys were pretty mild men. 
Thank you. People went ballistic. So the notion of having a traffic signal, a traffic signal, and another traffic signal was We've been down that path before, and people were just not pleased with that. So I just thought I'd add a little history there uh, regarding that. So, yes, there's a motion on the table. Thank you, Mayor. It's a pedestrian signal, not a traffic signal. Council enhances a pedestrian signal, not a traffic (laughs) signal. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. What do you what, what do you call a signal at a lot at a lago? It's a traffic and pedestrian signal. I mean, that's what you're looking at if you're installing infrastructure at that particular intersection, because you will find a hawk is not appropriate for that application. Thank you. Do you, off the top of your head, know how much it would cost us to lay the conduit? Um, <laughs> Mayor, I'm members of the council, it, it's. It, it's not much. You, you would run two four-inch conduits um, typically for future signalization, and you're talking 100 feet. You're talking 400 feet. I mean, you're talking a few thousand, few thousand dollars. It, mm-hmm. it wouldn't adjust the bond at all. And maybe by the time that happens, there might be even better systems. There might be new, there could be new technology. And I just would like to put it in rather than not rip up the road at some future time. Um, if it didn't cost that much. That's all. So you didn't have to do it. There'll be another council to vote on that, another yeah. day to argue. And Vice Mayor Elsie has got... Well, you know, we haven't talked about a tunnel yet either. So when are we going to talk about that? Are we, gonna, we haven't discussed... Paul, how much would a tunnel... Um, I like... Uh, Mayor... Who's uh, put time to Mayor, members of council, I actually, I actually have an answer for that. Um, I was told by the town engineer that the town did apply for a grant. Um, Back in the 90s, roughly over a million dollars, again, um, was not approved. Um, I know when we first started this discussion, Council Member Dickey had, had brought that up when we looked at it. Um, right at the, inter- oh, oh, right at oh, the oh, intersection is very <laughs> difficult. Sit, sit down, Paul. Like, right. right. No, 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 I don't want to hear the number. No, 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 no. What's oh. the number? Yeah, you might as well tell us. Uh, right now, I can tell you. I mean, there's, so many, there's so many utilities out there, you'd, you'd probably be well over a million dollars. Mayor, can we call for the vote? Please. Uh, roll call, I guess, just to be sure. Hold on. Can we, all kidding aside, restate the motion? Okay. I move to maintain the modified freeway stop uh, intervention currently being proposed in our projected bond package. Thank you, Mayor. And we have a second. Okay. Uh-huh. Roll call, roll, please. Council Member Yates? Aye. Council Member Dickey? Aye. Council Member Henson? Aye. Council Member Brown. Uh, Vice Mayor Elsie. Aye. Council Member Leger. Aye. And Mayor Kavanaugh. Aye. Mayor 7 0. All right. I make a motion that everybody that's here has to stay till the end of the meeting. There's snacks at the end. You may not know about this, but there are. Consideration of approving the town. 10-year capital improvement plan infrastructure improvement plan for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2013. Okay. Okay, well, members of the council, you've had a work study on the numbers. Um, this, again, is prepared uh, annually for the CIP, um, for the, and especially for the upcoming fiscal year 13-14. Um, we're also, um, at this time, we're also going through uh, um, a development fee impact study, which requires the adoption of a 10-year CIP. Within that, that uh, creates the um, infrastructure improvement plan. So <clears throat> with the adoption of the CIP, also sets forth our IIP study that we've, we're required by a certain date. This, this will be it. This will be part of it. Yeah. Um, within that, we have to come back with it for the, for the study. Anyway, what you have uh, before you is a, a number of projects uh, in the capital projects funds, how we use the funds, grants, developers, uh, contributions or requirements, um, exactions, I guess they're called, um, excise tax, development fees, general funds, and bonds, uh, totaling $58,144,690 for that. Within that 10-year plan, though, you have that um, presented to you, and if there's any changes in that, we'd be happy to try to discuss them now, but it is staff recommendation to adopt this. Any good council discussion or speaker cards? Okay, let's go to the speaker card. 
So now we have one speaker card, Linda Bordeaux. Council. I've got a couple questions. The street maintenance facility improvement is scheduled to be $225,000, and it says the sources for that are being paid by other sources, and I'm just curious to know what other sources is that coming from. Um, and also the fire station expansion, that is sorely needed. I was uh, privileged enough to take a tour of the fire station, and uh, there is no place for female firefighters to be in there at all. I mean, some of those conditions are deplorable. It's almost smaller than being on a naval ship what they're sleeping in. They really do need to be revamped. But the cost of it is $500,000. And I'm curious to know, one of the um, statements in the form uh, under the capital projects, the explanation of it is, it gives you an opportunity to use some new technologies that would enhance energy savings. So I'm wondering, is it mandatory that you build that out by the EPA under some restrictions, or is this something we're opting to do? Because if it's something we're opting to do, we could save a couple hundred thousand dollars, maybe a hundred thousand dollars, not only in the engineering and designing of the building, the actual purchasing of the materials. Um, I understand I want it to be energy efficient, of course, but some of the standards that are set out there are a little aggressive. Um, and that was it. That's all I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot of mold down there, too. I smell bad. Well, yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's bad. pretty pretty bad. So we need to give those guys and gals their, a, a good place to live. Could either Ken or Paul answer the question about other? Uh, uh, Mayor, members of the council, I just I just looked at that project, and it does show other sources, and that was actually supposed to be first. So we would have the finance department change that in the table. We can make that fix easily. Um, as for the fire station expansion, um, we just had a 30% design meeting this week, um, that, so that's moving forward. Um, and, and we are looking at using the energy efficient and the, you know, air conditioning units and if we have to change out appliances. Um, it's not a LEED certified building, so it doesn't go overboard on the energy efficiency, but we want to, you know, take every step possible to be as efficient as possible. Okay, thank you. Any other council comments? Council Mendicke. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Andrew, the, um, the IIT part of this, so looking at the projects that even go 20 years ahead, it looks like the only two that are using development fees are the Pocket Park and the Adero Trailhead. So how is this fitting in with what you have to do, and then how to, you know, as far as it be, being able to be eligible for development fees, since we don't appear to have any projects that will be using them. Madam uh, Mayor, I'm from Vicki. The, the IIT portion of this will come back to you at a later point in which we identify those things that are in the development fee study that are intended to be paid for with fees. This capital plan is a bit ahead of the schedule and when we can do the IIT. So we'll be back to you again to talk about exactly that, on which ones are going to be in the plan and funded by development fees partially or, or fully. But we have a, a lot of procedural hoops that were placed in our way by the legislature a few years ago that we have not yet done to get that adopted. So, Mayor, uh, Andrew, the, the idea of the, the, the renovations of the fire stations and such, the, especially the third one, that could technically be under that, possibly. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, we have the, the tr urban trail that sort of goes into some of the stuff that Cassie was talking about because the sidewalks, mm -hmm. which the sidewalk general plan, I found interesting things looking through the general plan, and we have a sidewalk plan in there too. Wouldn't those, the sidewalks might be a little hard as far as growth, but could, what about as far as parks or the trail aspect of that and using development fees for that? I know that there's not going to be a lot of money, but at least it would be, because um, I know there's sometimes where we say, can we use development fees, and all we don't have it in the plan. So every little bit maybe to get in that, if possible. Um, one of the things that we need to keep in mind with development fees especially is that they are only growth related. So that, particularly with sidewalks, it's difficult because you would have to, you have to parse out at least the portions that are related to addressing the current deficiency. And I think that the adopted sidewalk plans have addressed many current deficiencies, then causing that number to get smaller and smaller and smaller and not making it worthwhile to actually try and 
prove up that there are new growth-related impacts, particularly when the sidewalks are in existing neighborhoods. So that's, that's a challenging piece of it, and that's the same thing that applies to the fire station. If it's replacement of existing facilities, you have a very difficult time imposing a new growth component on that. If it's a facility that serves one area and when moved and expanded will serve a larger area, the delta between those two can be development fees, but only that portion. So Station 3 certainly is a portion that will be development funded. Station 2 replacement is much more challenging. Okay, thank you, Mayor. So we're talking about the step, and as we move forward, obviously we, um, you know, change things when we go through the actual budgeting process. So just three items I would be uh, want to bring up, I guess, is possibly the out the alley paving, and if um, that can be broken up in a way that that uh, spends a little bit less this year. That's just one of the things because I, I would really like to follow what Councilwoman Hansen talked about a little bit, which were those um, abandoned or, or what would you call them, the sidewalks that just sort of cut it's off. Creating sidewalks. Yes, so. yes. So if we're looking at, you know, not having enough money to look at doing any sidewalks that are that kind of end, um, that would be one place I would wonder if we could look. And then just to put put it out there, there's 400 something thousand dollars in there to replace the light in Pal on Palisades, and we might want to talk a little bit more about that um, as we go forward because you know there's maintenance fees for I mean maintenance costs for those and uh, and so just to put that out there too when we get to the point where we're actually discussing the nitty gritty for the for the budget. <laughs> Did you want to? Oh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> I was reminded of the, the work study that um, a number of the sidewalk things were removed from the capital improvement plan. And in kind of talking amongst some of ourselves, it, it thought maybe it was kind of a fatality that went along with deleting like one of the sidewalks on Fountain Hills Boulevard and kind of an obscure place. and. So maybe they just, the ones downtown went by the wayside when those other ones were eliminated. Was it ever broken down of what it might take? Because I know we had it identified at one time where there were just, you know, those little colored pieces of sidewalk that were identified that could be filled in. A, just a ball, a real rough ballpark of what it would be to just that infill sidewalk. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, two years ago the CIP had three separate sidewalk projects. There was the Fountain Hills Boulevard sidewalk project, which was um, partially grant funded. There was the downtown sidewalk project, and then there was town-wide sidewalk projects. Um, just lack of a better term, a funding casualty, all three were removed from the CIP. Um, for the downtown sidewalk, I believe the CIP had roughly um, th $35,000 to $40,000 a year over a five-year period. Typically, those get put in by the developer when they develop that vacant lot. Um, we made a kind of a mad rush at the end of the year when it was still in there, and we did the one um, by the by batches and the one just down past Town Hall. So those would have to get if it's not if it's not budgeted item, we can't. Well, we'd have to come back to council to make a budget transfer later on. So maybe, as Jeannie was saying, maybe take just a small portion from one of the other projects, you know, downsize it just a little bit, just to put some of those back in. So we could just yeah. get, you know, the more, the more owner. I'm thinking mostly on La Montana, because that's where you see people walking out on the outside of the cars because you know, the sidewalk in. So they go out into the street, you know, on the outside of parked cars. If we're talking about the same area, there's a, is that where it's really big elevation difference? Yeah, that's not a cheap one to fix. <laughs> step? Can we put in step? No. Yeah. Uh, ramp? Bridge? Yeah. You would have You would have to put in a ramp. <laughs> uh, I, I'd have to ask the town attorney, but that would, that would need to be a, motion by council to add a project 
And then we have to figure out how to pay for it. The, is the light in the district, is the light 13, 14, or I can't, I can't find it right now. I know it's right here. The, the light on Palisades 400,000? The light on Palisades is tied, would be the same time as the Saguaro project. 14. So it would be a year and a half. If the bond. So year, what? 14? 15? Yeah. Yeah, 14. I, I think we feel it's just fiscal year just because you would, if the bond does pass, you would be start, you would be starting design yeah. this fiscal year. Hmm. Well, on there, then can you divide the alley paving up a little bit differently? Well, well, I mean, we can. We're at, we, we have some sort of a mandate to do it, and if we don't do it, it, it was as funds was available. As funds was available. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. You could definitely push one out and move some money around, but then later on, if you didn't have enough money in the future, you'd be trying to find money again. If you're in creating a new spot, a new project, you're going to have to take it from someplace. Right. You're not going to be able to extend something out. You got to take it from. You got to reduce another project. Yeah. And I guess you'd have to know in advance how much that sidewalk would cost too, because it might be a lot more than just taking a little piece from something. It might be a, a large amount. And honestly, I don't know what the project is, so. Yeah. Uh, there's, about four, there's about four or five gaps in the sidewalks in the downtown areas on vacant lots that haven't been developed. Okay. But we, you, I know you would have no idea what that would cost. The previous capital improvement yeah. program two years ago, I believe, had, believe had 150,000, 130 to 150,000 over a five-year period to fill those gaps in. Oh, what's another year? And then we got 12 more months to figure out where it could come from. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to yeah. say, yeah. yeah. say one more other thing, though, as far as applying for grants. Walkable communities and safe routes to schools are grants for sidewalks that we could look for, too. Correct. No. Looking for a motion, unless someone else wants to. No, I was just, I mean, we have a suggestion on the table. Paul's basically saying that was, uh, we did have a plan for downtown. It's 30000 across um, five years. I, I think that's very doable. Um, to find 30000 you know, or this, this fiscal year. Um, and, and, and tongue in cheek, uh, Kathy, you had mentioned. Um, I mean, alley paving is, is mandated for, for PM10, which is dust mitigation, and um, doesn't that apply to the dusty areas where people are walking on? Obviously not, but um, I'm not sure if um, Councilman Hanson was planning on making a motion or not, but I think that downtown plan, we know what it was, we know what it cost, it was filling in gaps, a cost of $30,000 a year, I believe, when you look at our capital improvement plan as is, you, 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 can, you can squeeze that money out of a few projects. So what's the pleasure to come? Well, we could... Go ahead. Councilman Yates has a suggestion. I was just going to remind everybody with the way things are going with the median project, if we come in even at the uh, most conservative budget, we're still going to have a little bit left over when I say a little bit, a few, several hundred thousand dollars left over, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we should look at that at a future or, or to take what uh, Council Member Hansen said, let's look at this in the future. We've got a really good plan here. Um, it's concise. We're, we're all aware of it. I, I think we should go with what we've got and let's put uh, pen to paper and actually see what the project is before we estimate right here, right now. I think we're going to have some other uh, avenues to, to fund it. I'd agree with that. I think this is a good plan, and I wouldn't want to start cherry picking money here and there. I'd rather us see what we had from the other project. Do you want to? Mayor, rather than cherry picking, we could simply uh, look at the plan that we have, which is a good plan. We have a cost for the plan. We're talking 30 grand a year. We do have a downtown development fund. We are using the downtown development fund for these types of projects. So rather than taking it from someplace else, we could just add it as a project number in our plan and cost it out, 
coming from the downtown fund at a cost of $25,000, $30,000 a year. Or, or, or <laughs> um, possibly do it, add it into the medium improvements, much like the lights were a component of the medium improvements. And if the costs come in so much better, as our two council construction gurus say, then perhaps that could be added into that project as well. Councilman Brown, you want to, as a guru, I, would you like to talk? I, no, absolutely. I think we need to leave the median alone. We've already added tons and tons of new little pieces to the median. Uh, so I think we leave that alone, and I, I would have to concur with uh, Council Member Leger that if we do anything, we just simply uh, take the downtown development fund, put a, put a job number beside it, and, and go about it as a separate job and not try to ear tag anything else on to the median. I'm looking for a motion. Anyone like to make a motion? Would you like to make a motion? No, I was just no. trying to help Jesse. Uh, Councilwoman Hanson out has been discussing this for quite a while, so uh, I'll just put the ball back in her court if she wants to move in that direction. I already asked if she wanted to make a motion. Did you change your mind? No. Yeah. You're not going to make a motion? No. Nope. Madam Mayor, <laughs> I move to approve the proposed capital improvement plan for the 10 year period beginning July 1st, 2013, as written. Discussion. Just one comment, Mayor. Uh, the uh, budget that we have for the relocation of fire station number two is about $2.1 million. I know we had some discussions about another location that contemplated putting it on shade. There's been some discussion about the Fountain Hills Boulevard. I would put that there's probably going to be some funds there because I think some of our estimates was that it wasn't going to be $2.1 million for Fountain Hills Boulevard. So that may be a possible revenue. Uh, a place for revenue to do some of these other projects. That's all. Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mayor 7 0. Thank you. All right. Then we're up to our discussion with possible directions to staff related to any item included in the League of Arizona Cities and Towns Weekly Legislative Bulletin or relating to any action proposed or pending before the state legislature. Ken? Mayor Cameron, I'm here with the council. Uh, where do I start? 1100 bills. Um, which ones do you want to talk about? Maybe we just the most important one, the CCC. CCC. I think that's our favorite. <laughs> Uh, the best thing I can tell you is that, um, if, I guess it, did it, it went out of committee. It passed out of ways and means by eight mean. to zero and somehow ended up in the program. Ended up in appropriations. Yeah. Discussions about modifications of that or potential amendments at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Was it, is it scheduled in a post now? Let's just see what the chair of the approach can do for us. Well, Mayor, just to, to make people feel a little better, there was a, an amendment that was uh, an attempt to, to make it a little bit better for cities. And out of the eight yes votes in, on ways and means, seven of them mentioned keeping cities whole or in other ways that um, they would vote yes now, but if this provision was still in it later, that they would not be supporting it. So I was, I, I was pretty... Um, Happy to hear that. There's only one one member who said something pretty critical of cities, but everybody else seemed to be like, yeah, this part isn't good. So, and we have hope to convince them afterwards, right? Uh, anything else in the legislature? Here, just a quick question, uh, town attorney Andrew. I read recently, don't know a lot about it, that there's been a house bill reintroduced uh, uh, allowing. Um, Firearms in public buildings. Can you address that? Can you, on top of that, um, Madam Mayor, uh, Councilman Rose, now, uh, I, we have not been following that one, other than just the news of it recently. Um, I, I do know that the implementation discussions have been sparked up again in Town Hall about moving forward with how to implement what's required and, and the distances that are involved. Um, trying to ma manage those and which facilities we'd have to address. Um, that's all that we've discussed so far. Though. And to add, I, actually, I found that 
this morning, um, by chance. I didn't know that was was introduced. So we, if we want to follow that, we can seek direction from the council if they want. But I, I think it's something. It. Well, I'm not voting here. If we have to vote on it, um, I think it's something we should vote on. It's come up in the past. It's been controversial. I've had a number of citizens diametric, you know, very much opposed to firearms in public buildings. So. I don't have a lot of particulars on it. There might be some criteria. I know they've talked about lockers outside the building. What concerned me when I read about it was that one of the rationales for moving forward on it was that someone carrying a weapon, concealed or otherwise, is inconvenient because they have a weapon coming into a um, public building. And I guess I would suggest if someone's inconvenienced, perhaps they could, you know, lock it up in their car. Um, I'm not legislating here, but I would just like some clarity on and follow that. I think it has serious implications for public buildings, as it has in the past. And as we recall, it went through the House before, and the governor vetoed it. Thank you. Well, I think right now, um, as it stands with this building, we have a no guns sticker on the window, but technically we're in violation of the law, but because there's no penalty, because I believe you are supposed to have lockers, you're supposed to right now have or not have the sticker. Is that correct? The requirement is for a, a secure storage area. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now the the official storage area is the sheriff's department because they're in the building. Um, and the indication is that through this bill that it would actually be moved to an outside locker was, mm -hmm. was the remedy that the, we were talking about earlier. Um, we can follow the bill and, and figure out where it is in the process. I don't know what vote's been taken on. All we've been given is just a, a report mm -hmm. about it. And we can certainly see where the league's position is and see if they're taking the same role as in last year. But that also applies to the community center where there is no sheriff's department. That's correct. Right. And so there is no storage. And to the library, but we have yeah. one in the library that the county manages through the library staff. So the only thing I know about is that the new bill was crafted in response to the fact that governments are supposed to have a place of storage and they don't and there was no penalty put in so this is to make it a little clearer if you if you um, deny people the right to bring their guns in then you have to have a place for them to store it which they do at the capitol they do have a check at the capitol where you can check it at the desk if you go in and I yeah well then only the criminals bring their own thing. That's a good guy. Any other bills that anyone wants to talk about? All right, then. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned. Oh, thank you for the last of the people that hung in there. Thank you. I, we really appreciate it. Thank you.